five ten. Okay, so it's 5.11 and I'm going to kick off now. So I think you said I could just start with the, the slides. We'll share the slides, please. Thank you for the anthem. That was that was powerful. I'm going to call on Patience Ayase to lead us with the land acknowledgement. Patience is an assistant branch manager with TD, 
and she is the lead for youth empowerment with Council of Nigerian Professionals. She's a mother, a mentor, and a community leader. Please join me to welcome Patience. Over to you. Thank you. Land acknowledgement in the spirit and intent of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's recommendations, we acknowledge the traditional indigenous territories on which we gather at the beginning of all OTF meetings. By learning, understanding, and acknowledging, we wish to pay respect to Total Ireland, Mother Earth, and to the rich indigenous history of Ontario. We recognize that our work and the work of our grantees takes place on traditional indigenous territories across Ontario. We also wish to acknowledge that the Ontario Trillium Foundation's head office is located on the traditional indigenous territory of the Huron Wendant, Houdinashine, and most recently, the territory of Mississauga of the Credit. This territory is part of the Desh with One Spoon Treaty. Sorry, that went offline. This territory is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, an agreement between Anishinaabeg, Houdinashine, and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This territory is also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. We wish to express gratitude to Mother Earth and for the resources we are using and honor all the First Nation, Metis and Inuit people who have been living on the land since time immemorial. Thank you. So and at this so, point, okay. Go ahead. So at this point, um, a digital art takes over. Thank you, patience. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the Council of Nigerian Professional Celebration and Essay Contest. I'm going to be talking about three main things. One, a little bit about me. Two, why CMP? Why do we do what we do? And three, I will talk about um, what I want to talk about in terms of the Black History Month, which I title A Lesson in History. And so my name is Adeji Sola Atiba. I am the daughter of Haulat, the daughter of Adekbeju, the daughter of Onyi Damola. And I introduce myself like that because I want to give honor to whom honor is due. Uh, just like Patience said, we are on the lands of the First Nations. It is important that we respect them because the idea of Black History Month is about respect for the Black people. A little bit about me. Banking is my profession, I tell everybody, but community is my passion. I am able to motivate people that are not in a good place because I have been there. I'm able to encourage people to hang in there, that it does and will get better because I have been there. I'm able to support and encourage people to persevere because I have been there. I'm not, I not only do it in my community, but I do it in other communities too because I am proudly Canadian. This is our second year having the Black History Month event and also the essay writing. Why do we do the essay writing? Our children, our youth, they have a lot of ideas. We want to hear from them. If you want to support someone, you need to do discovery, understand their needs before you actually support them. So by doing this to our youth, we know we'll be able to help them better. And so, why did we even start CMP? We started CMP because of my experience when I came into Canada 16 years ago. I was told I need to go on welfare. I was told if I didn't want welfare, I can do PSW. I've always been known as somebody that gives. I don't believe in getting handouts. No offense to PSW, but I've been in banking for over 10 years in Nigeria and only to come here to, to change everything about me. There was no information. I didn't know where to go. 
So we want to make sure that when people need information, they can come to CMP. We want to give people the opportunity to be their best self, to bring their best self all the time. So we started CMP to ensure that people are not limited. I'm here to tell you that you can be whatever you want to be. You don't need to discount your experience. You don't need to discount your skills, your education. You just need to put yourself out there. You need to network. You need to be open-minded. It may be slow, but you will get there, as many people on this platform can attest to. We are going to be starting our mentoring uh, sometimes in March. So if you have the experience, please join the community and mentor someone. At CMP, we want to equip and support Nigerian professionals towards sustainable growth, development, and prosperity in Canada. We want to support the holistic well-being of individuals, marriages, and families. When we come to Canada, we experience a lot of changes that we've seen as impacted marriages. We want to be there to support and, and you know, give the needed support and encouragement to people so that they, they don't need to learn from their own mistakes. We want to enhance leadership skills, careers, business, professional development of our members. We want to provide support to new immigrants and international students. Provide training, information on wealth management and financial empowerment. We know that stories are told by people that have money. What can we do to empower ourselves in our community? We want to provide programs and enhance our youths, our children. We want to foster, foster better integration and understand Canadian multiculturalism and interfaith. We want our role models to mentor immigrant professionals. We want to support our businesses, our entrepreneurs, provide timely information, nurture positive professional image, um, and also focus on our social, economic, professional, political empowerment. Last year in 2020, we had over 25 events. Check out our YouTube channel, CMPNGO. Go to our website, www.cmpngo.ca. If you have ideas that you feel you want to share with us, email us at info at cmpngo.ca. And so my talk, a lesson in history. We're celebrating Black History Month. As Nigerians, we know our story. We know who we are. We know where we're from, our tribe, our languages and all. I know my story. I am from the Yoruba tribe, a descendant of Odudua or Romeo. And great kings like the Allah of Oboyo, keeper of the oracle, Oni of Ife. Historically, we worship Ogun, the god of iron, Shango, the god of thunder, Oya, the goddess of the sea. And we speak to the almighty god through Ifa Asorodayo, a messenger of the gods that will always speak the truth. My brothers and sisters from the Igbos, they have over 100 gods. They worshiped Amadioha, which is the most popular. He is the god of thunder and lightning, Allah, goddess of the earth. She represents fertility, creativity, morality. Ikenga, he is the god of strength. Hanyawu, the goddess of the sun and many more. The owl says they worship over 3,000 spirits or Iskoki. Gona and farm spirits are the easygoing ones, but Daiji, the bush spirits, they're the fierce ones. The Mazu, Maguzawa still worship this is Koki till date. Slavery has always been a part of life for us in Nigeria and other parts of the world. It is how great kings maintain their kingdom and show sovereignty over smaller kingdom. We have seen kings and princes carried away to serve, other, serve their new lords. All this before the advent of the transatlantic slave trade. We saw millions of our brothers and sisters sold into slavery, some kidnapped taken away to the Americas between the 16th and the 19th century. The transatlantic slave trade was a different kind of slave trade. People were deemed to be less than human. Their husbands, wives, children were taken away at will. They were deemed not to have emotions. Their beauty, high cheekbone, well-rounded body was ridiculed. They were killed at will, lynched, and many more horrible things happened to them. It had a negative effect on the African continent. Lawlessness, violence, the population was the order of the day. It was a brutal experience for those who sold in, those that were sold into slavery or captured. It was indeed very, very dark times. Then enough became enough. 
and slavery had to end. The inhumanity of man to man was stopped, but in its place came racism, segregation, lynching, and many more. Unfortunately, this is what some people know all their lives. You and I, we know differently. Unfortunate, and then came freedom fighters like Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, with different styles. Then the evolution of Black History Month and why we celebrate. We celebrate because it is now our reality. We're living in Canada. If we were in Africa, we probably wouldn't be celebrating Black History Month. We know where we come from, African continent. Our story, your story, is incomplete without this painful episode. Our story is incomplete without this painful episode. And so we need to learn. We need to read. History, we must learn to be better ambassadors. We celebrate people because accolades, recognition has been denied our people. People, people in spite of their oppression, they still rose up. They rose and became institutions on their own. Have you heard about Violet King? She was the first female lawyer in Canada. What about um, Elijah McCroy? He was a mechanical engineer. He invented and patented over 50 patents in US, Canada, Austria, Germany, Great Britain, and France. Peter C. Butler III became the first black police officer in Canada in 1883. Senator Anne Claire Cole, she was the first black female senator in North America. Senator Thomas Bernard is the first African Canadian to hold a tenure track position at Dalhousie University and to be promoted to a professor. The Honorable Lincoln I'm Alexander, Donovan Bailey, Viola David Davis Desmond, and of course, my story would not be complete without the Honorable Jean Augustine, a trailblazing politician, social activist, educator. Honorable Augustine carried our roots and conviction in community service, education, and advocacy as she entered politics in 1993. In 1995, a proposed motion before parliament to recognize February as Black History Month passed unanimously. And this is why we celebrate in Canada today. She was given so many accolades and honors and awards. In recent times, what about trailblazers like our very own member of parliament, member of provincial parliament, Dr. Laura May Linder, our very own Mrs. Nkechimwa for Robinson, Ms. Chinyere Eni, Ms. Are Thornhill, Ms. Mosumola Fulabi, Ms. Antoinette Walcott, Mrs. Shadia Wosomi, Ms. Abiola Jeremy, Ms. Tabe Salami, Dr. Yabioye, Ms. Deborojo, Ms. Patience Iyase, Dr. Mui Wogunlaja. Why is it that all these trailblazers' contributions are discounted and not given the same accolades like others? Whether we like it or not, a lot of us experience imposter syndrome. It happens to the best of us. The Canadian team for 2021 is the future is now. I say it is time we rise up as a people. Time we stop walking in silos. Time we become that support system for each other. Time to speak with one voice. Time to lead with love. We know where we're from. We know our journey. We need to move to the next level, whether from Caribbean, Americas, or the African continent. It is time we rise up together. Let's lead with education. Let's lead with tolerance. Let's lift a brother or sister up. And so today we will hear from our MPP, Laura Melindo. We will hear from Mrs. Nkechin Wang for Robinson. She will enlighten us about our career as Black people. What can we do to stand out? Mrs. Aosomi will help us and show us strategies to improve our finances so that we can have the guts to talk about our story the way it should be said. Mrs. Aderemi will educate us by identifying mental health and how we can maintain our wellness. Remember, high on sharpen it, high on. Let us rise up and sharpen love, nurture, motivate, support, and educate each other. I highly recommend
recommend you all get involved. We are in a country where opportunities abound, but we need to be engaged. We need to be at the table where decisions are made. We need to go outside of our comfort zone, outside of our community to be heard and seen, as only then can we really make the needed and desired change happen. Volunteer with Council of Nigerian Professionals. Be a part of building up our community. Be a part of building up our African Caribbean community. May God bless Canada, her home and native land. Thank you for listening. Thank you very, very, very much. That was, that was beautiful. The future is really now. It's now time for us to, to call on our very own MPP, Ms. Laura May Lindo. Laura May Lindo is a member of Provision Parliament for Kitchener Center. She's a respected activist and educator who holds both a master's and a PhD in education. She's the official opposition critic for anti-racism and citizenship and integrate immigration. Her commitment to building inclusive communities both within and outside of educational environment is grounded in a knowledge of how to put anti-oppression theories in practice. Her ongoing work to challenge systematic racism on campus and in the community has positioned her as a knowledgeable advocate for the rights of women and girls, a respected ally to marginalized community members, and most importantly, a courageous public speaker on issues often left unaddressed in the mainstream. mainstream. Please join me to welcome Ms. Laura May Lindo. Thank you. Oh, thank you folks so much. I have to tell you, those words were so powerful. I don't know if anybody saw my little face on there. I was crying. Um, and part of why I was crying is because a couple things. One, this is my last talk for Black History Month. And you know how sometimes the universe has you. You know when people say that, like the universe has you? So the universe has me. My parents are from Jamaica, but I'm actually... Um, initiated. I'm a Santera. And so one of the things that's quite interesting is that um, I couldn't do my work as a member of provincial parliament without finding a way to sort of bring my spiritual self and my activist self and my my own roots into the whole mix. And one of the things that I had started to do as a, a way to remind myself as I'm doing some pretty hard work, like talking about anti-Black racism is, is hard work. Um, sometimes you feel like you're talking to walls. So in order to keep my energy and my hope going, I would start talks by singing songs that I had been taught um, since my initiation. Um, once upon a time, I was a musician. So the bringing that creative energy into the mix has always been something that I've used to try and ground me. Um, but now that I've just heard all of these words and I know that I'm in, uh, as I often say, this room of love and my community has me, um, I'm feeling all that energy. You know that kinetic energy when changes are coming? I'm feeling all of that. And so in order to make this actual talk something that is worthwhile. I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to take a second and ground myself and it's going to involve me singing. So I'm just going to do it real, real quick. Promise. Promise I'll be done soon. Okay. I'm going to call on two other people in my mind to sort of connect me to the conversation that I want to have with you today. One is an ancestor, uh, Justice George Carter. So my best friend, her name is Jessica, her grandfather was the first Black Canadian-born judge. People don't know his name, Justice George Carter. He was born on Emancipation Day, which is awesome. So every time this job has me uh, in front of Queen's Park raising the, the freedom flag, I'm able to also greet him even though he's with the ancestors right now. So I call on his energy because I remember sitting down and speaking to him. And, you know, 
it's it's like a blessing and a curse to be a first. Um, it's a blessing and a curse because it's great that you were able to enter into systems that weren't made for you, but it's lonely to be in a system that's not made for you. And so um, I call on him because we've had so many conversations over the years uh, to, to remind me uh, through his own journey, he reminded me that the work I'm doing is important and it's worth it because more people will be at this decision-making table. More people will find their way uh, to that table, which means more of us will finally be free, be loved, be cared for, be safe. All of the things that we want in this world. The second person I want to call on, um, energy I want to call on, is is my uncle, Uncle Alvin, um, Alvin Curling. Alvin Curling was the first Black elected Speaker of the House in Ontario. First Black elected Speaker of the House. So when I, um, he ran for the Liberals, I'm part of the NDP, your official opposition at the moment. Um, he ran for the Liberals. And when I decided that um, the the NDP had asked me about six times to run and I had said no about six times. And so I was talking to Uncle Alvin and uh, and Uncle Alvin said to me, remember that every single political party wants the best Ontario that they can create, but they use different tools. So choose your tools, choose your tools. So I chose the NDP because they allow me to have moments like this where I get to speak very openly and truthfully, honestly, real talk is what I often call it, about the realities of anti-Black racism in this province, right? I, I don't have to hide it or sugarcoat it. I can be real with it and I can find real solutions because I can speak honestly and openly about the problem that we are, the problems that we are facing. Uncle Alvin, his portrait, because he was a speaker, like the, the old time portraits, you know, all the painted, he's the only black person in a major, major uh, space at Queens Park. It's only his portrait. There's some pictures of black folks that have historically come to Queens Park to visit, like a photograph, but there's something very powerful of walking down the hall of speakers and seeing all of these speakers over the course of time and then seeing my uncle, right? So before the pandemic, we used to have all sorts of educational tours. And so all these kids, they were so cute and they would come and they would be in front of the speaker, like in the hall of speakers and the person is doing the little discussion and whatever, whatever. And if I was walking past, I would interrupt them and make all the kids walk over and sit by my uncle. And I would say, that is Alvin Curling. He is my uncle. Say hi to Uncle Alvin. And they would all say, hi, Uncle Alvin. And I, because I wanted them to have an experience that they would remember. Because I didn't want them to pass by and not notice that there was a black man who had been a speaker in the Ontario Legislative Assembly. That is so important. When I when I was talking to Uncle Alvin um, at one point, I had said, oh, Uncle Alvin, you're the first black speaker of the house. He said, no, Laura May, elected speaker of the house. So I tell as my parents are from Jamaica. So they always have you got to tell all the stories in one story. So my mommy will always say, I tell you that to tell you this. Right. I, t <laughs> I tell you that to tell you this. Um, Uncle Alvin said to me that up until when he became the speaker, it was an appointment. So the party, the governing party appoints you to be the speaker. And then his name was there to be appointed. And then all of a sudden, everybody thought it was real important to be democratic and have a vote. And so all of a sudden, all the situation, the whole situation changed, right? All the rules of the game changed. Now we are lucky. And I say the royal we. Every single person in Ontario was lucky that Uncle Alvin still became the Speaker of the House because that history is our history now, right? That is our history. So they tried to play their own games and we were like, mm -mm, right? And, and the universe had us in that moment. The universe has me in this moment because my background is in education, right? 
So my master's and PhD are in education. I used to teach in teacher's college. Um, I've taught in a variety of institutions. I was an assistant professor at the University of Prince Edward Island and taught, taught in the faculty of education there. Um, I've taught at York University. Um, I've taught all over the place, right? And one of the interesting things that I realized was that all of the courses that I taught, my all of my research was on anti-racism in the school system. Like, how do you address racism uh, and racial discrimination in our educational system from K to 12 and also in post-secondary? And I, I was reflecting back and I realized when I was in teacher's college, I would teach courses to help these new teachers, these up and coming teachers um, to address racism. But my course was always the very last course they would take. So they have a two year program to become a teacher. They have two practicum when they get to go into a school and uh, write curriculum and practice curriculum and all of this kind of stuff. And then they would come to my course right before they graduated. And what did that mean? That meant they never learned how to use the theoretical skills I was teaching to them. They never happened, had an opportunity to try to do something, have it go wrong because that happens, right? You, you give it a shot and it goes all wrong and come back and talk to an expert in their field about how they could make it work. They never have an opportunity to actually bring theory and practice together. They're thrown into the system. And then once they're thrown into the system, we have what we're dealing with today. I don't know how closely uh, people have been following what's been happening in education most recently, but we have had um, reports of horrid examples of anti-Black racism in our school system in Peel, in York Region, in the Toronto District School Board, out my way where I am in Waterloo Region. Um, we have had horrible examples. And one of the things that I keep hearing consistently from young people that are in school is that when an experience of anti-blackness happens in the school, the teachers don't know what to do. It's not that they don't want to help. It's that they don't have the tools. And in my opinion, my professional opinion, it's it, the reason they don't have the tools is because my course is always at the end of their entire degree. Now, would you ever have a teacher go out and become a math teacher and never learn how to teach math? Would you ever have a science teacher go out and teach science but never learn how to teach science? It would never happen. But for some reason, when it comes to addressing racism in the school, we believe that the love of humanity is tool enough. And I'm here to tell you it's not. There's an art in, in, in the way that you approach addressing racism in a school system. It's, it's an art in the same way for math, in the same way for science, in the same way for health, in the same way for every single other subject <laughs> that happens in school. There is an art. There's a, a, a practice that they have to hone and try and get comfortable with. There's discussions and dialogues that they have to have an opportunity to actually grapple with. There's histories that they have to learn. Let me tell you something. The reason that um, I was drawn to uh, uh, a spiritual tradition that I am part of now is because I was never taught about my people when I was in school. I'm born and raised in Scarborough. I love Scarborough, right? I love it. I was born and raised at a time when the multicultural policies had just come out. They were fresh and new and everybody liked talking about them, right? And I was never taught about any black folks on this land. I wasn't taught about indigenous people either. In fact, I did French immersion. Um, and one day, many, many years after uh, I was, I was, I think even done some of my degrees, uh, my higher ed degrees, I realized that I had been taught when I was four, five, six, seven, that indigenous people in French is les sauvages, which actual translation is savages. That's what was in our textbooks. Nobody came back to tell me that that was wholly inappropriate. It was just me one day trying to, because in French immersion, you learn the language as second nature, right? You don't realize, you don't translate. And it wasn't until well after that I was starting to be a little bit more critical about what I had been taught that I realized that that's what was there. So 
with that being the case, here's what I know. Here's what I know. It's important for me to be at this decision-making table because I can bring these stories into community. I can talk to you about the kinds of change we need to see, both legislative and regulatory changes we need to see. And most, most critically, during a pandemic, because I... I can't talk about what's happening in any of these systems without paying attention to our reality right now. In the midst of a pandemic, we are still being left behind. We as Black folks across this province. Um, in Toronto, in Peel, in Hamilton, in Ottawa, and in Waterloo Region, public health units have released their own reports on the disproportionate impact of COVID on particular communities. Each one of those spaces have found that Black community members are disproportionately impacted by COVID. Every Toronto, Peel, Ottawa, Hamilton, Waterloo Region. Each one of them was not required to collect race-based data during the pandemic. That was something that we uh, were fighting for at Queen's Park, the official opposition. We really, 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 really need to collect the data because our whole system of support and investment runs on data. It's data driven. It's not based on stories. It's not based on anything. It's data driven. So we need to collect the data. The government didn't want to collect the data. We push, push, push. So then they said, okay, if a public health unit wants to collect the data, they may collect the data. Well, in Waterloo Region, Although the government said, okay, if you feel like collecting it, that's not very strong, just in case you're wondering, I'm being very sarcastic right now, right? If you feel like collecting the data, please. If it was loans from the government, they would make sure that the data was collected, okay? So if you feel like collecting the data, you can collect the data. In Waterloo Region, they did not feel like collecting the data. I wrote letters to the public health units in Waterloo Region um, alongside my colleague, uh, MPP Catherine Fife in Waterloo. She wrote letters with me. We wrote letters all the time. I sat myself on the Finance and Economic Recovery Committee to see what was happening. I made sure to get as many people that could talk to this committee as possible. We listened to 600, over 600 hours of hearings about finance and economic recovery for the province. Um, even within those hearings, people were saying certain groups like Black folks are disproportionately impacted by COVID, right? When the data came out, a lot of the public health units presented the, the findings, but then also had to note because they're researchers, we don't have enough data to be able to really determine what's happening, right? And as a researcher, I get it. But also as a researcher, here's what I know. If the findings are coming out in Toronto and Hamilton and Ottawa and Waterloo Region and Peel, I think we have enough data to be able to surmise that Black communities are disproportionately impacted by COVID. And because our system is data-driven, I think that we should have direct investments in those communities so that they actually survive the pandemic. Just a gander, right? Are we getting the direct investment? No. Um, in fact, when it comes to small and medium-sized businesses, small and medium-sized enterprises, professionals, entrepreneurs that are coming to me because I am the chair of the Ontario NDP's Black Caucus, because I'm the anti-racism critic, um, one of my critic portfolios has just recently changed. So it used to be citizenship and immigration. It's now colleges and universities. Um, people are coming to me from both of those portfolios. They're saying... The government has said we can we can get loans, not grants. They've encouraged us to go to the bank and get a loan to keep our business alive. If anybody understood the history of racism within this space, they would know that that is not the direct pathway for Black folks to be able to get what they need to open up businesses or keep businesses alive. Unfortunately, even today, when Black community members who are business owners, who are reputable, respected, go to the bank, they are unable to get loans as easily as their white peers, even during a pandemic. I, I have never, I'll tell you, at one point, um, I, was, uh, I was renting an apartment in Kitchener with my, I'm a single mama with three little people. I was renting a place. The owner of the home decided to sell because I, 
the market is hot if you're selling. Um, out of control is what I would really call it, but they called it hot. And so they decided to sell. So in the midst of the pandemic, I had to try and find a way to buy a house. And I'm a member of provincial parliament, right? So one would assume that my experience would be fairly easy. Like, and then I bought a house. On to the next sentence. However, I'm a black member of provincial parliament. And apparently my being a member of provincial parliament was not sufficient evidence when I went to the bank that I could get $2,000, just $2,000, just to cover one loan that I had to, I couldn't slowly pay off now because I had to find a house, right? They said, no, I tell you that because sometimes we assume that once we get into these positions, things change. Uh-uh, they don't. And that's why we need community. And that's why we need more of us. That's why we need more of us to be aware of what's happening. That's why we need more of us to support each other as we navigate these things. We need to be all over finance to make these kinds of decisions. We need people, my, my parents come, or my mummy was uh, from a long line of bankers. She is, she's still alive, sorry. She's, she just turned 82, but we say 36 because we want her to love us. So, mummy, long line of bankers. We need more of us in positions where when that story is brought to the bank, the bank actually does something about it. Not a, uh, what do they call them? Those, those groups that they'll have, like there's a black employee group or whatever, so that they celebrate black employees within the bank. We can have that too, but we also need to make sure that black folks can come and get a loan and that their, their documents are considered sufficient to be able to get what they need, just like their white peers, right? So all of that seems pretty um, sad and depressing. So I don't want to end us with sad and depressing. I want to end us with hope. Here is my hope. There are um, five black elected officials in the official opposition. We form the Black Caucus, right? We have been spending time um, bringing the needs of black communities to Queen's Park, black communities all across the province. We need more of us. We need more than just five. Um, I received a message, I think it was two days ago, from somebody who who was curious about the number of black people that are elected right now. There's 120 some odd of us. There's five of us in the official opposition. There's two black people in uh, that are liberals. That's it. We need more of us. We need more of us at Queen's Park where legislation and regulations get decided and, and looked at. We need more of us to have an eye to what that piece of legislation will do for our communities and more of us to advocate for direct investment because before we can get to where we want to go, we have to make sure that we've dealt with and cleaned up the mess that a, a um, system of slavery has left us, right? There are a lot of people that don't realize that slavery happened on this soil, but it did, right? There are a lot of people that think that we were the end of the Underground Railroad and everything was awesome. And it, it wasn't, right? And so we're still dealing with the ramifications of that. And the silencing of that history is one way of perpetuating that same kind of disproportionate impact on our community. So more of us in the Legislative Assembly will help we need to make sure that community engages in this discussion right now. This is this one's urgent. There's discussions happening right now about economic recovery from COVID. We're facing a third wave. Yes, vaccinations are coming. We don't know if they're they're running as quickly as they as they need to be. We know for sure that they're not going to the disp the communities that are disproportionately impacted. We've got to make sure that we fight for that. But we also have to engage in the discussions about what economic recovery is going to look like. Because there's been a lot of talk to me that's worrisome about can't wait to get back to normal. Can't wait to get back to normal. Except normal wasn't working for a lot of us. Normal wasn't working for black communities. Normal wasn't working for black youth. Normal wasn't working for indigenous communities. Normal wasn't working for communities that are low income. I don't want to go back to normal. 
I want to take this universal event, this global pandemic, and create the world that actually centers so many of us. Because when you center the most vulnerable, when you operate from a place of love, when you embed your policies and your legislation with love for people, everybody wins. But we need more people to come and say, mm, we can't go back to normal. Here are some of the big gaps that were happening there. Let's do something different this time. Right. And that's where staying in touch with my office, making sure that you're part of that. I can definitely make sure that when there are any hearings and stuff that you have that information, but also letter writing campaigns that you as an organization decide to do. You can see, see me on them just saying that you want to, you want a seat at that table, demanding to take your place at that table. Um, I think it's hugely important uh, that we address anti-Black racism in education. Because if we don't deal with the fact that there's an overrepresentation of Black kids in kindergarten that are being expelled or suspended compared to their white peers, then we are going to see the ripple effect of not having access to education in the same way. Now, the government, because of the community's push, actually, um, the government uh, has decided to pause. Uh, there will be no expansion, or uh, there will be no suspensions or expulsions of students from K to four or something like that. It's interesting that we ever had them. Can you imagine? I have a six-year-old. If I really was supposed to expel him, he would have been expelled so many times. Right. <laughs> but our job as adults in the lives of little people is to help them to learn. Right. It's not to say get out of the system. That doesn't make any kind of sense. But we were overrepresented in that, too. Right. So they've paused it. So until grade four. But what I do know is they say they've stopped it. And I just think it's paused. The, the system says that our kids are overrepresented among dropouts. I think they're pushed out. Right. So I have different language to express things from my perspective, my experience. Right. So we've got to make sure that we strengthen legislation um, to ensure that we address anti-Black racism in education. We've got to make sure that we support young professionals. And we do that by making sure that they get the education that they deserve. And that continues into post-secondary the amount of examples of anti-Black racism that I hear in post-secondary education, it's, it's wild. And there's no direct investment from government to do anti-racism work on university campuses. I know because before I was elected, I was the Director of Diversity and Equity at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, I was a director so for those that it, in the, the grand scheme, the hierarchy in a university, a director is not very high up, but I held the senior most equity position at the institution as a director. And my job was to oversee employment equity, uh, educational equity, to help faculty members and staff members when they were trying to address racism, to help students, to oversee the gendered violence prevention portfolio. I did all the things as a director. And what I know now is that no money is allocated from government that is required to go to that work. So it was literally the good graces of the administration that I even had a department. And after I was elected and I was, um, I was uh, asked to resign because I was elected, which is a whole other conversation we can have, um, my de the department that I had was dismantled and spread across the institution. Um, the last thing that I will say is this, because I swear this is supposed to be hopeful. That didn't sound hopeful, but it is hopeful. It did not sound hopeful, but it is. It is because... Yesterday or the day before, the Fifth Estate did a um, segment on being Black on campus. And in that segment, they talked about the kinds of issues that, are, that Black faculty, staff, and students are experiencing in post-secondary. And within that segment, it was so real and so raw that I now have people emailing me saying, we've got to do something about this. People are mobilizing and saying they want different, they want better, they want love and care for our people. And so 
that to me is hopeful because that's what changes systems because all of these systems are us. Like we are the people in the systems. And so if we can just keep that hope going, keep reminding people that we are worthy, we are valuable, we can love ourselves, we are allowed to ask for help, we are allowed to ask for culturally responsive mental health services, we don't need to be silent, we deserve love, then everything, I swear, everything is going to be okay. Said it, hey, oh, but the said it, hey, yo. Oh. Thank you. Wow. Wow. And wow. You. <laughs> I'm sure the words. First of all, you're singing, respect. Thank you so much for gracing us with your voice, with your wisdom. We really, really appreciate it. We have a couple of questions, but because of time, we're asking you just one question. And the question goes this, two questions in one. You're spiritual and you're an educator. So at what point do you have a, do you have a, a, a balance of both? because these are two broad end of the spectrum. Then secondly, when it comes to racism, is there a difference between the impact in universities and um, elementary or secondary school? How would you advise our youth in this forum right now wanting to discuss and, 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 and um, react to anti-racism? Um, thank you so much for that. I will try to be quick. The spiritual and the uh, educational, here's what I've realized. The system here in Canada thinks that it's separate. Our people do not. That's what I've realized. Um, our people think that you do better as a professional if your spirituality is part of that process, because that's what sustains you. Even a lot of the um, the racial justice movements that have happened in the world, whether you look at the Black Panthers or you look at uh, Martin Luther King Jr. or Malcolm X, or you look at the work that we're doing right here on this soil, there was a direct connection between their spiritual selves and their activist or educational selves, right? Because their activism was teaching people. Um, I think that our system tries to separate it out so that we don't have what we need to be sustained, right? Like I actually think that there's a desire to separate it so that we can't sustain ourselves because of how hard that work is. So for me, it's always one and the same. And in fact, I feel like I became a better educator when I was more open about who I was as a spiritual person. Um, so that's for me. When it comes to addressing racism and the difference between the impact, it's all trauma, right? That's not sounding very hopeful either, but to me, it's all trauma. And uh, people within the system try and tell us that our experiences of racism and anti-Blackness um, is just an experience, right? But it's traumatic. And if I was um, dealing with domestic assault, if somebody had uh, physically abused me, people would say that's trauma. And I think that it's really important for us to listen to Black healthcare workers who have said anti-Black racism is a public health crisis because it's trauma. And it's trauma that's been left without any kind of support. And so the impact in K to 12 um, and post-secondary is literally just an extension of the same trauma. If you've made it to post-secondary, without having to deal with the trauma of any anti-Black experiences that you've ex had from K to 12, you are on a thread in, in post-secondary. Now, when I was in post-secondary, there were like Black student associations, which to be honest, when I was in school, I didn't even know they existed because nobody, nobody told me that there was such a place as you know, a place where black folks can just go and I don't have to teach about racism. Everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say this was my experience. What has happened in Waterloo Region in the last two years, black student unions and black student associations have popped up in high schools. I have an elementary school 
in Waterloo Region that has a Black Student Association. Yeah. And so I say that because I think we're starting to realize that trauma deserves support and acknowledgement and gathering is not dangerous, it's healing. And so if we can encourage young people to be part of those associations, that's great. If we can encourage young people to, um, to do that, that healing work and get onto their healing journey, that's great. Um, one of the last things I'll say, because I know we're, uh, time is short. Uh, when I was in school, newcomers, like my parents are from Jamaica. They came here. I was born in Scarborough, so I'm first generation, right? But my parents were so wanting good things for us that they they didn't know how to navigate our educational system, right? Like they they didn't know. So they brought what they knew from Jamaica here, which was whatever a teacher says is right. And so because you respect the teacher, like the teacher is your parent, right? And it wasn't until Uncle Alvin actually was talking to my parents and he said, ooh, it's a very different system over here. You can't just trust it. And the example that that happened in my family was that my eldest brother, who was born in Jamaica, they tried to put him into ESL, into English as a second language. And my mommy had to go and say, I speak, I speak the Queen's English. My English is better than yours. <laughs> right? And so what is happening? I, I just heard that this happened to somebody like just last year, somebody was telling me that that's what was happening to their family. So that hasn't even changed. So all of that to say, we as Black parents raising Black children have to remember that they, as much as our cultural realities are what sort of drive us and, and such, here they're Black. And whatever the system thinks of Black folks, that's the stereotype they're up against. And so when they come and they tell us things are happening, we've got to believe them and support them to find the places where they can center themselves in love and care and compassion. And if any of you have any questions and need any help with any of that, you know where to find me. I will totally help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. From what I heard, we need to be represented in legislation. We need to love to gather because when we gather this strength, and you said one thing regarding the ESL, it's very true. When I came to Canada, I, I was told my, my, my daughter will be put in an ESL. I was like, no, we spent four years in the US. She speaks like every other child here. Bring me a child, let my daughters talk, let them speak and tell me the difference. So that was how I was able to take myself, not, not allowing them to put my child in ESL. So you are absolutely right. This is something that we as Blacks should, should take really, really seriously. And I will say really, really thank you so much for that. If you have more questions for, for Laura May, please send any questions. I will direct it to her. Thank you so much for gracing us your presence. At this point, I'm going to um, introduce Dr. Michael Gunlager. He's one of the directors of CNP. Um, he's a father of three little ones, a husband, and a lover of education. He's an educational elite. And um, I will say, please, the floor is here, sir. Thank you very much, Patience. Wow. Um, you know, Laura May, uh, I'm not surprised. You always deliver. And, you know, the emotional self and the spiritual things that, uh, you know, your speech is always, you know, mesmerizing for some reason. And I'm, I'm happy that um, so many of our folks here were able to, to listen to you mm -hmm. and to hear the call. Um, so thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Michael Gulaja. I'm the Director of Membership and Mentorship at the Council of Nigerian Professionals, and I'm the co-host for today's event. Black History Month is an opportunity for all Canadians to learn and, and you know, to learn about the contributions that Black Canadians and their communities have made to this country. Now, this year's theme, as the President has said, uh, is the future is now. This is a call to action for all of us to build on the legacy of those who have come before us and to recognize the transforming work that Black Canadians and their communities are doing now. Now, we are joined today by another incredible speaker who I believe is no stranger to many of us at the Council of Nigerian Professionals. Ms. Nkichi needs no elaborate introduction. 
he's the one that gave the You Matter speech that went viral with over 5 million views and shared over 20,000 times worldwide. Mr. Kechi is an experienced information technology professional with more than 20 years in the IT space. She has held a variety of progressively senior roles within various organizations, including the director, data center operations at Rogers Communications, delivery project executive at IBM, and most recently, associate vice president, segment technology executive at TD Bank Group. But this is not all. Mrs. Ikechi is an entrepreneur, an author, a professional bodybuilder, an inspirational speaker. Please, Ikechi, the floor is yours. Woo! Yes, who's that girl? I want to meet her. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I will always tell you, you actually want to give people commas upon commas upon commas upon commas upon commas after your name, right? So stay in action, stay delivering, stay awesome, keep elevating yourself. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't do anything. I know this sounds like the end of my speech, but I'm just, <laughs> but I'm just like, sometimes I just, one day I just want my intro to be my speech. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just, okay, here's the speech and that's it. And then applause and, and then I'm out. I'm like deuces. Anyway, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Patience, for inviting me into this space. I'm very, very excited to share energy uh, with everyone here today. Um, and I love, I love following speakers like Linda May because what they do is they fill you up. You know, there's something about, you know, when somebody drops nuggets and seeds inside of you and helps you to stand taller and gives you a reason to leave an experience knowing that you're just going to be better simply because you were there. And so she's done that. And I trust that I will as well. And so here's the thing. What I have to ask you is at what point do you stop attending events and nothing about your life changes? You know, like events should be life changing. You should be having daily life changing moments. There's not one day that is the same. Not one day. There's not one date in this entire world that's ever been the same. And so therefore every single day should be a life changing day simply because it's different. And so I ask that as you leave this event, you know, whatever she, whatever seeds she planted, whatever drop it, droplets, nuggets that I will share, that you will take something, just something, just some little piece that will change and transform your life. So my name, as you know, is Nkichi. I, I love when I'm with Nigerians because y'all know the definition of my name. So you'll know you're amongst a gift and I am a gift. And what am I gifted? I am gifted to empower. I'm gifted to ignite. I was just on a call earlier on today and it was with um, youth, younger people. And this year I said, God, you know, I am not blessed with my own children, you know, from my womb. I'm not, but I said, I'm putting that away and I'm, I'm opening myself up to receive young minds that have potential an opportunity to do well more in this world than I have been able to. So send them my way. And since then I've, you know, have a 13 year old mentee who's like a phenomenon. She's doing work with MIT. She's part of the knowledge society. If you don't know what that is, look it up. And then, so today that blessing had me talking to the university of British Columbia. And what I said to them is that my gift is to ignite to ignite what? To ignite just a little bit more fire within each and every one of you. Just a little bit. I believe I have the power to turn you up just a little more. And I want to do that all the time in every encounter. And so the other gift I have is creating amazing experiences for myself and others. I am born to win. I am designed for accomplishment. I am engineered for success. I'm endowed with the seeds of greatness and I am not wasting one little bit of life that God has enabled me to be able to do that and carry it out every single day. 
And I encourage others to do the same because here's the thing. My mission on this planet is to empower people, empowered people, empower people. And it is the lead domino that creates real sustainable train and change in this world. So imagine this, there are 35, 34 other people, other humans, live humans. I know y'all breathing. So live humans with the capability to inspire, to motivate, to empower another human. So imagine if each and every one of you, all you designed to do after you leave this event today is to empower one other human, you've now become the lead domino in that experience. Now imagine if every single day, and we're talking about career and, your, and, and how to build a career that you will love. Imagine if every experience, you treated it like that, that you are that lead domino, that you are that one person in that experience, in that meeting, in that event, whatever it is, in that room, in that space that you're in, that is gonna empower one other person because you know, empower people, empower people. And as a result, you just set the domino in effect. That's your responsibility. So I'm gifting that to you as well, okay? So as it comes to your career, and I don't know where you are in the career journey because I don't know everyone that's on this call. So I have absolutely no idea. Holy Spirit, work through me. Whomever on this call needs to hear this. I'm gonna I want to change up your game today. That as you go and you look for your career or you're in your career, you probably look at it as, in fact, do we have a chat? We have a chat here. I think the chat was a little bit quiet. Like I, I know I was a little bit quiet in the chat too, but I just want to know like, just somebody drop in the chat, like a few of you, just drop. What does it mean to be employed? I just want to have, let's have a little bit of a discussion. I have uh, 15 minutes left. So let's have a little bit of a conversation. What does it mean to be empowered? Oh, sorry, to be employed. Somebody drop that in. If you have to Google the definition, Google the dress definition, but somebody needs to drop that in the chat. Employed or employment. What does it mean? Somebody, to have a paying job. Yes, to have a paying job. Awesome, love that, okay? That is, that is actually, I think, the, the, the Webster Dictionary or something like that, but the definition of employment is the condition of having paid work, okay? So most of us want to be employed, right? What if I told you that the better position or the better way to position yourself whether you're currently in a role seeking to, to start a career is to seek deployment. Military people are deployed. Average people are employed. When you are in deployment, the goal of it is to spread out, right? When they deploy a unit in the military, it's to spread out. It is to utilize or arrange for a deliberate purpose. Woo! Let me try that again. When you are deployed in the military, you're spread out. You're utilized or arranged for a deliberate purpose. Now ask yourself, compared to being employed, which is the condition of having paid work, to deploying oneself into their career, into an organization, which is to spread out, to utilize, to arrange for deliberate purpose. Which now would you want to be? Put it in the chat. Deployed or employed? I often say, that where I work at TD Bank, and I'll tell you a little bit about my career, I am deployed at TD. I used to be employed, but six years ago, one day, true story, as I got to know who I was and I understood my magic, and I'm not the only person with magic, okay? Everyone has magic, okay? Everybody has gifts and talents and, spe and unique abilities that are only yours. You just need to find them. Okay. But when I figured out what mine were, I was like, okay, okay, God. I remember I was talking to my husband. I said, okay, E, I'm asking God to put me to work. 
to put me to work at TD. I didn't know what that would look like. I remember it was June, 2016. I'm on Front Street walking to my office building and I'm calling Easton and I'm like, babes, man, I feel so good about life. Like I feel so good about who I am, but I don't want this just for myself. I want to spread this. I want to utilize this. I want to arrange this for a deliberate purpose at TD. There are 80,000 employees at the time. Now there's 90,000 and 26 million customers. And I want to be in service of them all. When you choose to do that with your career, no matter whatever organization you work in, I promise you what comes back to you will be behind beyond your biggest beliefs because it's no longer about what they're doing for you. It's everything about how are you utilizing your gifts, your talents, and your abilities to empower everyone around you. I don't care about your title. Has nothing to do with title. Has everything to do with who you are. And so as you step into your career, as you're already immersed in your career, because you can do this in or out or in or at the beginning, you have to know who you are. And when I started to really know who I was six years ago, like who I really was, like when I'm in a room, what capabilities open up simply because I'm there, everything about my career trajectory changed. It no longer became about what position, what title I had. It's all around impact and influence. How am I making a difference? How am I leaving my legacy? And why is this important? It is uber important now, and I'll tell you why. Because everybody has skills and talents, it's evident. But if there's anything that this last year in COVID, with the amount of job loss, with the amount of people that are out there now looking for a job, there's gotta be something beyond your unique, beyond your skills and your talents and your abilities that sets you apart. And it was required before, but it's uber required now. And so I encourage everyone, absolutely everyone, yes, skills, talents, abilities, absolutely important. They'll get you into rooms, but it's your character that's going to keep you there. So really work on getting to know who you are. Okay, so that was, once I set that on a path, then I knew how I was showing up at work. I am deployed. I am, I just happen to be paid by TD. It's an absolute bonus to get a check every two weeks. Honestly, it's a blessing. But the rest of it is deployment every single day. No days off on that, okay? And then number two, as you start to really think, and patients, we've had a conversation about this, is you really want to understand, you know, strategically what are the biggest and greatest needs of this world? Because that's where you want to start aligning your career. You want to look at those strategic spaces, those places where you can innovate, where you can create, you know, write this down. You want to start to make sure that you're in rooms where change is happening. So you're not stuck in the yard where consequences are received. A lot of us are in the yard where consequences are received and it looks like this. You get an email, it's from the organization saying that we are going through a transformation journey and this is all the things that you need to do as a result of that. And then you start complaining, you're resistant to the change, you find it hard to figure it out, you're worried about your job. That's what it's like being in the yard where consequences are received. But when you strive and seek out those spaces where you can be in the rooms where change is occurring, then you're on the creator side of that communication. And you then have and possess an ability to create change and influence the direction of what is happening in your organization. And I don't care what level you're in, it exists at every level. That's where you want to be, okay? So really, really start to look at those places where you are going to be able to be a creator and not a consumer, okay? That's number two. And then number three, 
is probably where I am right now is don't be afraid to put yourself out there. It's really, really important. I think, you know, beyond, beyond the work that we're here to like beyond the job and that you're, that you have the career that you have, it's really important to put yourself out there for something good, for some purpose, right? Whether it's in or out of your organization, it is hugely imperative. And I would say that in a year where I was not expecting it, I had, I was totally shocked when TD just said, hey, we noticed what you do and put me forward for a gigantic Canadian award, right? And so you're not necessarily doing it for the recognition, but you're doing it for, for, for the fulfillment that one day you can express that I was here, okay? So just before I um, hand off to, um, to patients, so remember those, please remember those three, three things. Know who you are, you know, really focus on deploying yourself, you know, start to really change, shift, shift your thoughts on whether you're deployed or employed, you know, and then be a creator, not a consumer. Find those strategic spaces and areas where you can actually create change, okay? It's really, really important. And now is the real unique time to really position yourself in those type of, in those type of spaces. And then beyond that, put yourself out there. Jump off a cliff. Your parachute will open. You might be bruised and broken along the way. <laughs> but I promise you, it will, it will absolutely, absolutely open. You just have to trust it. I love, I love these days because I have to challenge myself too. Oh, I'm a God-fearing woman. And then I'm worried about what they might say. <laughs> God's already said. Right? God said. Everything about who you are to be will come to pass. Make no mistake, right? And so I want to leave you, I leave you with really those three things. Um, but over and above that, I, you know, I also want to just talk about how we're positioned as people. Okay. We often, um, and I'm sharing this because it might be a little bit con contradictory to, and maybe not, maybe not. So no disclaimer. I think it's really important you know, as we, especially in this with the whole Black Lives Matter movement and the whole uprise of race and the look of race is I just don't want us to forget about what our network looks like, right? Like we also have to be mindful of, is our network diverse? Diverse networks get things done. Just as we're saying that, you know, we're not an expense, we're an investment, is the same way that you need to make sure that your network is also investment worthy. So it needs to be diverse, you know? So really do look at, look at how your network looks. And as you look at how your network looks, I wanna also ask you who, how are you positioned in other people's networks? It's very, very vital. You want to be an, a source, an engine, a connector, you know? You want to be in people's networks. So just as you want to, let me put this a little bit better. Just as you want to know who's positioned in your life, you also want to know how you're positioned. So for example, break it down a little. I know how I'm positioned in patient's life. Okay. I would not be here if patients did not think that I was an energizer and inspirational and motivational and had wisdom. She wouldn't have, she would not have called me. So I know how I'm positioned in patient's life and patients must also know how she's positioned in mine because I would not be here if patients wasn't somebody with a huge heart and incredible laugh, <laughs> the ability and the infectious nature and such a giving soul and a drive for excellence because I don't hang out with chickens. I only hang out with eagles. And so patients must know that to be in my tribe, she's soaring like an eagle. 
Okay. So really know how your position patients, if you didn't know that, you know, love to you. <laughs> and so it's really important to know how, what, how you are also positioned in your network and then also know who's positioned in yours. Okay. So that, that was a little bit of a bonus. Cause I was just going to leave you with the three tips, but I really want to encourage, like, I'm a huge, I'm, I mean, I'm moving from networking to super connector. I want to be a super connector and just to enable a network that can just continue to connect people to connect people. Um, and I think, cause I think that is incumbent on all of us to continue to connect people um, just to really, you know, help people, you know, and you do that through creating connections. And so I want to become a super connector and I, and, and therefore it's incumbent on me to encourage everybody to do the same. So that's what I have for you today. I, if there's any questions, I'd love to entertain any. Um, but really and truly, like at the at the end of it all, all of you are divine, amazing humans, right? Like know your unique talent and your unique gift and why you're here. Stop wasting time. Stop wasting time negotiating with whether you belong. I'm actually, you belong. It's on God authority that I tell you that you actually belong, that you matter, that you are enough that actually on today, you need nothing more than what already lives inside of you to get everything that you want in this world, period, full stop. So stop negotiating. We negotiate in our minds all the time, mm. right? Don't negotiate with lack anymore. Mm -mm. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Kichi. That was like awesome. You know, your talks are always powerful. Attention grabbing, I, I love it. I love it. You know, CMP is so blessed to have you on our side. And thank you, Patience, for, you know, introducing uh, Mrs. Kichi. She's, you know, she just hits all the right nails. And, and I believe that each, one, each and every one of us, we, you know, we're going to get better, you know. Uh, we're going to get something out of this. And hopefully by next year, you know, you're seeing directors and VPs just popping out from here and there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you said it. Declare it. Declare it. <laughs> I have a question here. Somebody is asking a question about, says, how do I find out about myself? Do you have any clues for them to, you know, figure out, you know, where their talent is, who they are? How do they do that? Any clues? Yeah, I think the first thing, I, so, so I will talk about um, your, who you are in a minute. But the first thing I want to, I want to let everyone know, um, and I read this in Purpose Driven Life. It's a book by Pastor Rick Warren. And I think it, after the Bible, it's one, of the, it's one of the most translated and read books in the world. Um, but it's innate in all of us is about 500 to 700 hidden talents, right? And um, another, uh, what's his name? Um, oh my gosh, what's that? Bishop, 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 a Bishop. Guy. Oh, anyway, he's uh he's past now. He's gone. He's past. Oh, what's his name? The Jamaican guy, right? Yeah. Uh, well, Burmese, Burm 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 um, Bahamian, Bahamian, uh, Bahamian, right? Uh, yeah. Anyway, he Miles says Morrow. Miles yes, Morrow. Miles Morrow. Yes. He says that the graveyard is the richest place on the planet, right? Because a lot of people pass without allowing their right. So, so the one thing to find your gift is just really watch what excites you. And here's the thing. We discount things like I like to organize or I like to iron. I'm being really, really basic. Or I like to fold laundry or I like to, I like to write. I like the way my handwriting likes. We, we ignore all of these little gifts and talents and abilities because we think that they're not bright light, big stars. Doesn't seem like there's millions of dollars, but you don't know until you follow that nugget. No, no interest should ever be discounted. Nothing that you actually like to do for free. You do more for free than you do, for, than you're paid for. So what are the things that you like to do for free? You know, and maybe what are the things that you're paid for that you would do for free? Right? So, so don't ever discount any, that's how I found mine is like these little things that I like to do. And I'm like, oh, I like actually organizing th like birthday parties and this, any other. So I tried my hand at doing events. And I've had sold out events, right? Like, so don't discount anything, okay? So that's number one. And then in terms of finding out who you are, and this is Inky Chi's wisdom, right? 
maybe there's countless of ways, but I don't know. I think this is the way. <laughs> is who are you when the worst shows up? Because when everything is great, we are the best humans on the planet. Like we are nice and everything's great and everyone's like hug and kiss and this, that, and the other. And then we get into our car, we're going to work and somebody cuts it off and all of a sudden we're like, yes, you, yes, you, yes, you, yes, you. And you roll up beside them, you're like riding on the window and you're like, yeah, you're giving them the finger. Like all of the, like, who is that person? <laughs> right? So sometimes we do not look at who we are when the worst shows up. My husband was my biggest teacher, right? In those moments where we have an argument and all of a sudden this person <laughs> is unrecognizable. The positivity gone out the door. And then I was like, okay, that, that, that's like schizophrenia. Like, you know, that's like, this like felt like bipolar, like one minute I'm like, and so I was like, okay, no, I really like my positive nature. And I'm not really liking that person that showed up. And so I said, why, who is that person? And that's when I started to look at myself. So I became really uber aware about how I show up when somebody told me that, you know, they're having a child and I would be jealous didn't feel good. And so I'm like, okay, why am I jealous? You know? And then I started, oh, that's why. And then I started to replace that lie with the truth because what's going to happen is you're going to have to play the replacement game. You're going to find out what implanted that lie in you that made you react that way. And I mean, I don't want to get too philosophical. Whoever asked that question, you might, we might have to get into like a mentoring conversation, but, but it's really, it, it is that you have to realize that in a, in a, in a moment, there's going to be a, part of you that shows up. And if you don't like that person, that's where you have work, not the other person. You have work to do. You are responsible for how you show up, how you react. And when you start to look at that, you start to understand who you are. I always tell this introverts an extra, a good example. I'll give you an example. We often use terms to describe ourselves. I'm an extrovert. I'm an introvert. If most people ask here, if you put in the chat and I said, tell me if I'm an introvert or an extrovert, most people are going to say Inca Chi's an extrovert, but I'm not. I'm actually very introverted. Like there comes a time when I've had enough of y'all and I want to be quiet. I don't pick up my phone. I'm not trying to go on social media. I just want to chill out without anybody calling me. That's my recharge. And it's a big portion of my day. I work out by myself. I, I love to work out, but I'm not working out with y'all. And so there's a big part of me that could also be termed introverted, but I do it a little bit different. I will go further and say, I know who I am so much that I can tell you that what you call introverted is me recognizing and pulling from energy from other humans, from recognizing that my gift is to give to humans. And so when I'm amongst another human, I realize that activate the power of empowerment. And that's what you see. And then when I'm by myself, I realize that I need to recharge, to, to recalibrate, to bring in so I can recharge that energy. So I have enough reserve to serve when I'm back out again. So sometimes we just fall victim to big, 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 big categorizations and fail to get to know who we are because most introverts are not full on introverts because I've met introverts that once they're around their brethren, their friends, their tribe, their kids, <laughs> you wouldn't think that that person was introverted at all. So it's about getting really crisp and clear to be able to articulate who you are. And a lot of times, like I said, you will do it, especially in those moments that were not the most favorable. So I know thank we're at you. time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much, Mr. Kichi, for your time and the answers. We're so grateful that you, you're able to share your time with us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> so it was Franklin D. Roosevelt that said, and I quote, we cannot always build the future for our youth, but we can build our youth for the future. The youth is our hope for the future our greatest treasure. At CMP, it's our duty and desire to encourage and inspire, inspire our youths to dream of greater tomorrow. But with the recent event, I believe the future is now. The youths are the present and not the future. With that, 
I bring to you Kale Iyase and Nicola Odu. These fantastic youths are social shifters who are making concrete steps to participate in social progress. CMP has decided to give them this platform to share something of interest with the group. And Kale will go first, Nicola will follow. Kale, over to you. Hi, my name is Kayla Iase, and I wanted to tell a story of self-love and self-discovery. It took me years to learn how to love my natural hair and appreciate my identity as a Black woman. I actually almost lost myself because of peer pressure. In grade five, I moved from a public school to a Catholic school, and I didn't have many friends. I was more focused on my education, so I hadn't put much thought into it. That all changed once I entered grade seven. I had natural hair all throughout my life and I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have. I was a child, so my mom would style my hair with beads and other accessories. One day, a girl approached me and we ended up becoming best friends for years. Although it wasn't her place to give me her opinions on my hair, she would repeatedly taunt me for it. I dealt with constant bullying and harassment for years disguised as friendship. She would say that I look like a third grader, that my hair is too childish, and even worse. I tried my best to endure it, but in the end, I was filled with insecurities. In grade 8, I was coerced into making a decision that would change my life forever. My best friend told me to cut my hair to be short like hers. I valued her opinions and thoughts of me, so I begged my mom for weeks. It got to the point where she finally agreed on one condition. I relaxed my hair instead of cutting it. When I went back to school, my best friend was angry that it was too long, and for the rest of the year, I was ostracized by the entire class. This was all while I was desperately trying to come to terms with my new appearance. Since my hair was pinned straight, it couldn't hold braids or beads like before. I, I would put in bantu knots to curl it, but I could barely style it the way I wanted to. During the first COVID-19 lockdown, I was able to start my natural hair journey, and I'm grateful I had the chance before it was too late. I'm learning how to love myself and appreciate myself as a Black woman, despite everything I've been through. I hope my story can inspire others, and I wanted to say that you can get through it, even if it's hard, and even if you think you can't. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Kayla. Thank you so much and for sharing that. I was so bold and I didn't expect anything less from you. You're a very talented young woman and uh, we're going to see more of you. Now, um, Nicola, I invite you to share something with the group. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Nicola Odu and I'm completely grateful to be able to celebrate such a wonderful event with you all. I'm a student in the GTA with very high ambitions and dreams to excel and represent my community. In doing so, I hope to break down harmful racial stereotypes that target the Black individual and the Black family. As you know, I competed in the essay writing com competition. I spent lots of time trying to speak about my knowledge concerning the Black community. I really wanted to speak about something that inspired me personally and hit close to home. And I remembered my struggles growing up, a black girl in a white majority country, the transition from being surrounded by the warmth and embrace of my black family into a demanding yet condescending world. It caused me and many others to struggle with our identities to find where we truly belonged. But now, I finally found my voice and I want to speak every single day and help those who still struggle. What I found was that it was important to always look to my strong and foundational form of support, my family. There I found peace and I found answer. It is so important more now than ever with the Black History Month as well as Black Lives Matter movements to focus on Black familial structures as they are what protect Black individuals and uphold healthy values to support them. 
I am forever thankful that this subject is being spoken about and we can improve as a nation and as a people. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. That is awesome. At this junction, I would like to crave uh, your indulgence, uh, Kichi, Mr. Kichi. If you could please announce the names of the winners of the essay competition. Oh yeah, I'm so delighted. Okay, so do you, uh, I just need a little bit of some, am I to start with third prize or? Yes, please. Yeah, third prize, third prize, okay. Yes. So drum rolls and third prize goes to Nicola Oldu. Oh, the, 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 there's nothing that happens. There's no like, no? I just keep going? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can keep going. Um. And then there was, boom. Okay. Second prize goes to. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> which means I think that first prize goes to Ama Iguilo. Yay! <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, at this point, I will humbly request the MPP Laura May to please uh, present the certificates to each winner. And I believe the certificates will be mailed to the winners at their respective locations. So um, I have to let you folks know that out my way, I am still locked out of my office due to COVID. So I have the certificates are going to definitely come to you. So right now I'm just speaking what would be on the certificate, which is congratulations. Thank you for using your voice, your voices to talk about things that matter to you most. And please know that the community around you, your families, your friends, your new friends like me, are hearing you, holding you, and doing everything in our power to make sure that everything you need is available to you. So carry on, keep on keeping on. Super proud of you all, and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Laura May. Now I would like to congratulate Ama, the first prize winner. You did a very good job. Um, I read your, your, your essay. It's fantastic, I would say. And I would like to invite you now to address the group just for a couple of minutes. Yeah, so my name is Ama Igulo, and I grew in grade 11. Um, some inspirations for me. So being an active member in the Cultural Connection Club in my school and hosting and leading many events to uplift black people and show the experiences to um, people of the world inspired me to write this essay. So as one of the few black people in my school, I was an act activist, I was an advocate for black students. Um, this helped me writing on the importance of Black History Month in Canada and the effect on people. Many times, me and my brother have conversations about how black history and black culture has affected society, how it has shaped and created the world we live in now. Not only my brother, but many people in my family, like my mom, who is always confident and is never scared to call out injustices when she sees it. My sister, who uses a YouTube platform to talk about the issues in the world. And my dad, who funds many black businesses. All of, the, all of them help to bring awareness to the issues that's happening to the world and the injustice that we go through every day. Also talking with my friends and hearing their experiences, and also watching so many YouTube videos on, on social media and everything like that, I hear and I tend to see all the black people not getting the recognition that they get, they deserve. Most of their accomplishments are diminished, are ignored. And also understanding firsthand how the educational system has failed to recognize black people and their accomplishments was one of the major contributions for me writing this essay. Um, finally, I just want to see how grateful I am to be able to express my opinion on the complexity of Black culture and how it's impacted the world today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amma, for your speech. We're all <laughs> proud of you. Please don't stop. Continue to break the barriers. Continue to reach higher heights. You have the support, just as Laura May said. You know, we are all here to support you guys. And... Uh, you know, we're happy that you have it. Uh, you you have everything together. You know, and this is really good. Moving on, I would like to invite Deborah Ojo 
Deborah is one of the directors of CMP, and she'll be making a few announcements about our corporate members. Over to you, Deborah. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. I hope everybody has been enjoying their evening. I'm Deborah Ojo. I'm a real estate agent. Uh, I also happen to serve as a director on CMP. Um, today has been very insightful. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your evenings with us. We want to take the opportunity to um, provide um, some to thank our sponsors for some of the for sponsoring us for believing in CMP. Um, as I said, I'm a real estate agent, a proud sponsor of uh, CMP itself. I um, there is uh, Mr. Emmanuel Onobanjo is uh, is he works with under, and we just as at CMP we want to encourage us as black people to also support black businesses. So if you ever need a car. If you ever need to change your card, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Onobanjo is your plug. Um, also, I want to rec uh, recognize um, Atoye Abioye. Mr. Atoye Abioye is a financial advisor. We need a lot of finances. We need the capital to be able to make the changes that we, we so much dear for. So if you have, if you want to talk about your finances, you want to plan your debt management, mm -hmm um uh, manage your debts and talk about different things buying a house and you know doing all of that please talk to mr toy uh, mrs esther abraham is uh, is a fantastic colleague of mine uh, she works with royal page she's very she was a lawyer so she brings all the experience from that to now selling a home and helping you to get the top dollar so she's a proud sponsor of uh, cmp as well so if you ever need anything uh, regarding to real estate, please reach out to R. Um, I also want to shout out to Miss Yemisi Alade Shua. Uh, she works with Right at Home um, uh, Reality, and she's also a real estate agent. So if you ever need anything, she works mainly, I think, in the Durham region. Please reach out to her as well. Um, SDA Business Solutions is uh, they are an accountant accounting firm. So if you need anything about your businesses, your trying to start a business, HR, HR, uh, payroll, bookkeeping, anything like that. And we are also in a tax season right now. So please uh, reach out to them, support these businesses, let them know that you're here to support them. Even shout out to them sometimes, and I'm sure that they will be more than willing to help you. Um, Ms. Jane Eken, Eken she uh, works with BMO as a mortgage specialist. So if you ever needed to talk about uh, mortgage pre-approval, uh, get ready for, for buying a house, please reach out to Ms. Jane Eken. Um, Mrs. Bossa Day Fai, Fai Mi, Fai Miss Bossa Fai Mi, she's a marriage coach. So our marriages, uh, we need to stay in a place of healing as Miss Nora said, so please reach out to her and I'm sure she'll be more than happy to her sister as well. Um, thank you so much. Um, one in town bread, they are uh, from Milton, but I'm sure they deliver throughout um, GT as well. So if you ever need that African touch to remember, to remind you of your uh, heritage, please reach out to them and um, they will be more than happy to assist you as well. As well as Light, Lighthouse Food, we want to thank you for your sponsorship. Lighthouse Food, uh, food is an African grocery store and they're out of Mil Milton as well. So please support them, let them show them your love and give them your business. AIY's -A Place. Uh, they serve uh, African food, you know, all those yummy food from back home food. Uh, home food. Um, do do moi moi, stewed chicken, all of those um, they serve. Uh, please reach out to them, show them your love as well. And thank you so much. If you have any, if you are if you are doing any business and you need advert advertisements or you just want to support CMP or you want to sponsor our events, empower our youths and all of that, please reach out to us. I'll put our email in the uh, in the chat box as well. Um, and our website also in the chat box. Chat box. Thank you. I will now hand over to Emmanuel to um, continue. Hi everyone. Take a break. Take a break. <laughs> I think uh, we are going to go on the musical break yes. just for a few minutes. 
and then we'll come back um, to listen to Mrs. Shadi Awosomi. So we can go take a break, you know, get a coffee, get a tea, you know, take a bathroom break, and then we'll be back. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> we are pressed for time, so we had to, to shrink the music time. So we're going to go ahead now and introduce our, um, sec our third speaker. She's none other than Mrs. Shade Awosemi. She's going to speak on financial empowerment. Mrs. Shade Awosemi is a financial campaigner with over 10 years of experience in helping Canadians build wealth protect wealth and guide them to financial independence. She is a trained agricultural economics and now is certified and she's also certified in insurance and investments. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Shade to the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I've been enjoying myself, honestly, since the program started. So I want to really give kudos to uh, Laura, to Inkechi, to our children. Honestly, you guys have been wonderful. I learned a lot, a lot. I'm telling you, you know, so I don't even know whether I should speak again or we should just talk about what we have learned. But anyway, we will talk, you know, <laughs> we'll talk briefly. Can, will I be able to share or I just... Um, is it possible to share the screen? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to introduce myself briefly to you. My name is Ola Shadi Awusami. You can call me Shadi, even though I cannot sing like Shadi Adu. It's okay. You know, I love the music though. So how did I get here? You know, um, I came to Canada as a permanent resident in 2009. Like any other person, we came here with, you know, several degrees. We want to have a good opportunity, but what, like we say, was the land, no opportunity. And one thing that Nketi said that really resonated with me was that, you know, you should know you, who you are and you should also uh, put yourself out there and uh, see what your strengths are. Thank God that, you know, I was able to figure out what my strengths was even though i knew a little bit about it before but you know sometimes challenges of life will not allow you to really really uh, bring out what your strengths are i knew myself that i love to teach people you know and uh, i'm a very patient person so i can go over things over and over again so i don't get tired i don't get bored when i teach people and they don't understand but in the course of doing what I'm doing today, I also figured out that I love to write. So I have a blog that I write inspirational messages and it has really helped me for my business too. So first I want to say everybody has the skills, they have the talent, it's just for you to find it out. Okay, let's go to financial education now. You know, um, many, many, many people are hurting in Canada and the United States, not because they're not working hard, they work so hard, but their money is not working for them. Let me give you some statistics. I believe everybody can see my screen. So in Canada, only about 35%, about 35% of Canadians do not have any savings or investments. And only 27% private sector workers are, have an employer funded pension plan. What people have is defined contribution. What does that mean? If you start your own pension plan, then they can top it up for you. Many people don't even have anything. It is very shocking to know that the average savings in RRSP is only $55,000. The good news is many people will live long. So imagine if you retire at 65 and you have only 55,000 and you still have about 35, 40 years to live. Will that be enough for you? It's ironic. We live in one of the wealthiest countries of the world. You know, how many people have called you this month alone saying, hey, how can I come to Canada? Uh, patients, please, can you help me to come to Canada? Many, many people, but they don't even know that Canadians have their own challenges too. Many people are living in debt. Debt has now become a way of life for so many people. We need to change. We need to change, just like what the speakers have, you know, talk, told us to do. We really need to change. We cannot accept everything as it is. Black people should be millionaires in this country. Black people should be entrepreneurs that will make good money. 
we need to change. We know the task is not going to be easy, but we will start from somewhere. Remember, there is nobody that is more interested in you than you. Not your bank, not your union, not even the government or your employer. You have to take your own destiny into your hands. You need to learn. And uh, like I said, the tax will not be easy. What is the rude awakening? You know, most people grew up thinking if they could get a good college degree, get a good uh, grade, get a good job and start living a life and retire. I'm telling you, job will not get anybody there. That's the truth. It's only a business. And somebody says, if you're working to make income to pay your bills, you are vulnerable. Why don't you think of doing something great for yourself today? Many people look at, okay, how much am I going to need to start a business? But I'm telling you, it's just for you to find out. If you want to be a financial campaigner like me, to be a financial professional, you can talk to me. The cost is not, honestly, is nothing. You need to have your own personal savings. You need to be self-secured not government secured because if you look at this traditional tool of retirement you will see that the only one that you can control is your personal savings unfortunately many people don't save we're living from one paycheck to another paycheck so that is why i'm saying that a job will only give you a living but a business will give you a fortune let's talk about social security for a minute do you know that in canada as of 2019 if you work in Canada for 40 years, the maximum you can get in Canada pension plan is only 1,300. So think about it. How long will that take you? You know, in a month. Think about it. Like I told you, company pension is nothing to write him about. So we need to be self-secured rather than socially secure. You need to make money. If your income is not giving you enough, you need to look for something else on the side. You know, somebody says for every one dollar earned in Canada, an average Canadian spends one dollar seventy five. What does that mean? People are getting into debt. Debt has now become a way of life for so many people. We want to build your we want you to build your financial house. And building a house, you know, there is a way to build it properly. Let me ask you, Sister Patience or Brother Emmanuel, if you want to build a home and you start from the roof, what happens? You, you know, the house will collapse. That's true, you know, but that is what many people do to themselves. Trust me. So for you to build a proper financial house, you start from the foundation. Foundation here is protection, and I'll break it down for you. Protection involves insurance, investment, health, and education. What we see most of the time is when people pass away, the next thing is go fund me. That's it. The next thing is go fund me because people are not properly protected. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, oh, you're back I'm now. so sorry. I don't know what happened. So we need to properly protect ourselves. It is not about insurance, but what will insurance do for our family if we are no more there? Or if our income stops, you know, temporarily without being financially devastated. That is what insurance is all about. Unfortunately, I'm telling you, it's so sad. And I have this sense of responsibility to let everybody know. GoFundMe is begging, but that is what we see. It is begging. I'm telling you, when people fall sick, it's GoFundMe. When people pass away, suddenly it's GoFundMe. Why should we put our family through all that? Honestly, so it is very, very important for us to talk to somebody today. We are here to help each other. That is how white people leave a lot of legacy for even their unborn generation through insurance you know, through critical illness, through disability, income replacement, and through long-term care. So please make sure you don't leave this place without thinking of it and putting it down as I'm going to talk to somebody about my insurance. What about debt management? 
Many, many people are living in debt. People are sinking in debt. I'm telling you, I was there before. I had about three or four credit cards. Everything was about $13,000. It gave me sleepless night, trust me. When I receive a 1 800 number, I can't even pick the call. I'm so scared. I'm like, did I pay Scotia? Was I late on CIBC? What kind of a life is that? But I'm telling you today, I'm happy that I am credit card free. Yes, I still, has my, I still have my mortgage, but very, very soon, by the special grace of God, with my business, I'm going to be mortgage free very, very soon. What about emergency fund? You don't want to wait you know, until your roof starts leaking before you know you have to put some money away. You need to put two to six months of your income away in an investment called emergency fund. You can do it. What about investment? Don't just put everything in RRSP because you're still going to pay tax at the end of the road. But unfortunately, every Canadian puts all their money in RRSP. And I tell people, if you know you're not going to have money when you retire, then you can max it up. For me, RISP might not work for me because my income keeps increasing every year. So if I put $1 million in my RRSP and at the end of the day, I still make $500,000 a year for my business, guess how much I'm going to pay in taxes? Close to 50, 50%. So have I worked for the government? I've worked for myself. You can learn more. You don't need to just sit down there and say, okay, it's okay. It is not okay. I'm telling you, it is not okay. You need to learn. So, um, what did I do? I can scroll up again. I don't know why. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to talk, you know. So, what are we trying to say? You need financial education. You need financial illiteracy. Because there are three major obstacles ahead of us right now. Number one is the retirement crisis. People live long, but unfortunately, many people live longer than their retirement income. Some people have 30 years to plan for their retirement. Some people have 10 years. Some people have 20. What you need to do is to know your financial number. We call it fee number. Because if you work today and you make $50,000, for you to properly retire, you need $1 million. So you need to know that and how you're going to get I'm so happy. I'm so thankful to God that when I came to Canada, all my three children, I people like to tell you. Children are going to school with OSA. We don't want to do that to our children. Hi, Pastor. You seem to be breaking out. I'm sure. Hello, Hello, can you hear me? Hello, yeah, you seem to be breaking out. Hello, can you? Um, this internet, I don't know. So what yeah. I was saying is, all of us, we didn't go to school with loans and debt. So why should we put our kids through all this? You know, Another challenge is spending crisis. Like I mentioned earlier, people are spending the money they do not have to buy things they do not need, to impress people that they don't Sorry, like. Miss, I was coming to break your echoing. You need to, you need to mute one of the uh, devices. devices you're using. Hello, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Okay. So yes, people are buying enough. things they don't need with money they do not have to impress people that they don't like or people that don't like them, all in the name of trying to belong to the Joneses. You know, keeping up with social media can be very, very expensive. So what are we trying to say? If you are in debt, you don't have to wait there. You don't have to cry. You don't have to sob. No, you don't have to do that. All you need is to speak with a financial professional to help you. You can learn more by coming to a financial literacy workshop. If you are interested in learning more, please talk to me later. I can give you the link. And you know what? It is free of charge. You don't need to pay a dime. And these workshops happen every day of the week. Every Monday at 2, 
8 p.m. and 10 p.m., three times a day. On Tuesday, two times. On Wednesday, two times. On Thursday, three times. And on Friday, two times. You can learn for free. And you will learn more. You can also bring other people to come and learn for themselves. So what are we trying to say generally? Financial education is what will give you financial freedom. According to Robert Kiyosaki, he says that if you want to be financially free, you need to be financially informed. So, and that is my own job. That is what we're teaching people, how to get out of debt, how to increase their cash flow. Cash flow is king. How to build a solid financial foundation for themselves and their family. You know, how to build wealth. The formula for building wealth is not just putting money in a checking account in Scotia Bank or CIBC or RBC. That will not make you wealth. You need money. You need some time. You need a appropriate rate of return, minimum of 5%. That rate of return should be able to take care of inflation and should be able to take care of taxes. That is when you can say you build wealth for yourself. You know, many people pay a lot on their credit card, 18% to 22%, you know, and they have $10,000 sitting down in a checking account that they make only 1%. Do you know what you're doing? You're actually building wealth. Sorry, you're actually building debt, not wealth. Because the rule of 72 will work against you. Have you heard of the rule of 72 before? Maybe not. But what does it say? If you have $10,000 and you put it in, in uh, a checking account or mutual funds that pays you 4% and you leave it there, every 18 years, which is 72 Divided by four, every 18 years is when your 10,000 will become 20,000. Another 18 years, your 20 will become 40. So if you are 29 years of age today, by the time you are 40 year, uh, 65 years, your money would have just become 40,000. So think about it. But what if I show you somewhere you can make 8, 12% on your money? If you divide 72 by 12, you're going to get six. So if you leave your money where you're going to get 12%, Every six years, your 10 will become 20. Your 20 will become 40. By the age of 65, your money will become 640. It could work against you too, because that is why people get into a lot of debt and bankruptcy. So if you owe people at 4% and you don't pay back or you're just paying the minimum, by the age of 65, if you owe 10,000, your debt will be 40,000. But what if you owe somebody at 12%? and you don't pay back or you pay minimum, at the age of 65, your debt will be 640. So that is why people say, I don't know. Somebody called me some months ago. I don't know. I keep paying this money, but it's like it's not reducing. It's just increasing. It's the rule of 72 that is working against them. So guys, because of time, I know my time is up right now, and I don't want to go over time. Like I said, if you want to learn more, please reach out to me. I'll be able to help you. And also, if you want to have a copy of the book that I just shared with you, it is free of charge. With COVID, we, we, we're sending the soft copy, you know, so you can reach out to me. You can earn a lot from it. Basic concept like tax savings account, RRSP, segregated funds, mutual funds. What do I do? Which one works best for me? What is interest rate? What is compounding? What is inflation? And many, many more. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and I don't take it for granted at all. I look forward to helping somebody to, you know, change their financial, cost of their financial life because it's not about working. It's about being financially free and independent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Round of applause for her. Thank you so much for, 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 for bringing the financial world in a few sentences. You said something, financial education is what will give you financial freedom. That is very, very, very important. And um, once again, you also made us realize the rule of 72. I have never heard of that before. I'm going to take up a challenge and go and do some research because when you stop learning, you, you, stop, you stop growing when you stop learning. So rule of 72 is my next assignment to go and understand as he has applied to my life, because that really is an eye opener. We have lots of questions, but I'm just going to ask you one because of constraint of time. Um, the question will be will be this: It goes like this. It says, "What are the benefits of having an RESP, RESP account 
and how does it work for a family with three children? And I said one question, but just one more again. You, with, with the with the rule of seventy two, how how how, how how can one successfully overcome that 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 rule? It doesn't become a problem in one's life. Thank you once again for 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 for, for being here. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So let me answer the first question. What is RESP? Is Registered Education Savings Plan. And what that is, is set up by the government in 1998 to help parents send their school to their children to school, higher institution, with, uh, without any debt. So if you start that RESP for your child, you, you know, the government is going to match it up to 20% of what you contribute. And when the child becomes 18, you cannot contribute anymore in that plan. Also, it depends on what you contribute. You know, if you contribute the maximum, you can get a total of 7,200 in the life of that child, which is 18 years. Sorry, not the life of the child, the life of the plan. Sorry about that. So if you contribute more, you will get more. But where can you buy the RESP? You can buy it from the bank. You can buy it from insurance company. You can buy it from investment company. You can also buy it from a group scholarship plan. But I'm telling you that group scholarship plan is the best because that is exactly what I did for my children. The reason is, number one, there is what we call attrition. Attrition means that, you know, the children will get above what you even contributed because there is uh, your principal, your um, government um, CESG, that is Canada Education Savings Grant, and also the, the interest on the grant and the principal will you know, be in a pot that will be distributed among the ch children. Another thing is that if a child does not go to school, you know, they will distribute whatever the interest on the principal and also the interest on the grant among the other children. But I can say categorically, because we are Nigerians, all our children are going to go to school because they do not have a choice. It is not negotiable. So honestly, I'm sorry if anybody feels somehow, but you know, it's not negotiable. So they must go to school. So another thing is that it comes automatically with insurance, life insurance and disability. What does that mean? In case the contributor passes away suddenly, that money will be available for the child at the age of 18. If they become disabled too, the same thing. So what many people do to themselves is Okay, this are yes, I just go to RBC. Okay, I get to the counter and the guy says, Okay, how much do you have? Uh, actually, I have $50. Okay, it's okay, we're gonna open the account. But your child is 10 years of age. The child has eight years to get access to this money. So think about it. It costs average of about fifteen to twenty thousand per year for a child to go to school with residence, with books, with food and everything. Do a mental calculation. Is $50, $50 enough? Will it be enough to grow to that money you really wish? So what I'm trying to say is sit with an advisor who can explain to you how much it will cost for you to send your child to school at that time and how much you should be contributing to get that maximum. I hope I'm able to explain, but you can also reach me if you need more explanation. Another question, well, what was that, please? I'm sorry. You are muted. Thank you. <laughs> Your muted is about the most popular word in COVID, in COVID scenario. So the rule of 72, what is the best way oh. to overcome it? Okay, thank you so much. The best way to overcome the rule of 72, I'm going to explain it in two ways. Number one, if you are borrowing, make sure you look for the lowest rate of return. And how can you get that? You have to maintain your credit. Make sure your credit is good. Because if your credit is not so good, honestly, they will push you to a corner where you're going to accept maybe 10% or 5% or whatever. And the more the interest rates, the, 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 the faster your debt is going to double. So you need to do that. And if you already have debts, the only 
way you can do that is vision. Those two things will help you a lot. And on the uh, on the positive side, if you are investing, don't just put your money in a checking account, number one. If you do that, just put it under your pillow. It's the same thing because it's not going to grow. So make sure you speak to an advisor. I'm telling you, you cannot go wrong with speaking to an advisor. Trust me. So make sure you speak to an advisor. They'll be able to diagnose you financially and see where you are and know exactly where you want to be. Because you can't just put yourself in any kind of investment because your friend is in that investment. It might not work for you. What we, we're going to ask you is, number one, your time horizon. You know, for me, maybe I have just 10 years to retirement. Maybe for somebody else, they have 20 years to retirement. So I need to put my money where it's going to grow for me. Another thing is, what is your objective? Is it for retirement? Is it tax savings? Is it to just speculate? We need to know. What about your investment knowledge? Are you a sophisticated investor or a novice or you are just good? All those things will come to play because if you are a novice and, and you, don't, you can't take risks, Maybe if your 10,000 drops to 9,900, you're like, ah, oh, Charlie, where is my money? You know, we want to know the kind of investor you are. Let's know your risk appetite so that we'll be able to recommend what exactly will work for you. So rule of 72 will work good for you if you look for that high rate of return. For the purpose of compliance, I will tell you, you can get 12. But off the books, you can even get 50%. Like I said, we need to diagnose you and see exactly where you are. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so, so very much. That was, again, and very insightful and very mind-blowing. You literally took us to the University of Finance in 20 minutes. Thank you, and great kudos to you. We do appreciate you. At this juncture, Dr. Mag, please take over the floor. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patience. Uh, you all agree with me that this this year's Black History Month is especially different. You know why? You know the events that happened last year, culminating in the COVID nineteen pandemic, have shown us uh, a broken and fragile, vulnerable society. You know, from the killing of George, George Floyd, which sparked uh, peaceful protests all over the world, to the story of Breonna Taylor, and so many other senseless, inhuman killing of Black brothers and sisters. You know. You know, sadly, these events are not new to Black people. But the state of the Black community is viewed differently now. And why is that? Because there are video proofs. You know, I believe education and economic empowerment, social justice, health and wellness, and total well-being, they are important issues that we need to discuss to annihilate anti-Black racism in Canada. The person I'm about to introduce to you is a trailblazer in healthcare, health, healthcare sector. Mrs. Abiola Akiremi is a full-time registered nurse that supports individuals suffering from mental health. Ms. Abiola has organized conferences and workshops, both locally and internationally, to support vulnerable individuals. Ms. Abiola is the founder and CEO of A&M Healthcare Staffing Agency Corporation and A&A &A, Medical Healthcare Supplies Aid, a non-profit organization. Please help me welcome Mrs. Abiola Akeremi. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for having me. I'd like to thank the, the Council of Nigerian Professionals for having me to be able to give this uh, you know, presentation. I do have a PowerPoint and I don't know if I can uh, show this PowerPoint. So what do I do? Do I press present now? Yeah. And do I go to window? Yes. Okay. So you should have opened the PowerPoint. Yes, I have opened it. I yes. see it and I'm gonna share it now. I'm so used to the Zoom. <laughs> do you all see it? Me too. Yeah, it's coming through. It's coming through? Okay. Yes. You can see it now, right? Yes? Yes, yes we, we can, can see, see it. it now. Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so, you know, I'm so, I just thankful that uh, I have this privilege to be able to share um, 
a little bit of my experience with you. And uh, as a registered nurse in Canada, um, I've seen a lot of different things going on. And um, this is one topic that's very dear to my heart. I'm a, I work in mental health in the community. And um, um, and uh, it's, I see a lot of you know people really suffering from mental health. And right now with COVID, when COVID happened, it, it just, it just uh, became even more uh, difficult for people that are already suffering from mental health, now still suffering uh, from mental health, uh, going through some of the ups and downs and some of the changes that's going on in, in the community all over the world. And I, I'm sure that right now, since last year, that uh, everybody knows more about mental health. And we know, uh, you know, the, it, COVID allowed us to heighten and to create more awareness about mental health. And um, I just wanted to really talk about mental health a little bit and talk about uh, the resilience of uh, during COVID-19 um, and things that can help us and things that we need to be aware of as uh, a community, you know, um, in order to help each other. Because like we said, you know, coming together, sharing our live experience, um, it's very important for us to share what we're going through. I love when uh, the, the, um, one of the, the youth shared about her experience, about her hair. And, you know, with that, you know, we can take a lot of, you know, good lessons from that. And um, so sharing our experience, speaking out, talking, is very, very important that we, that we do that. So I'm gonna go through very quickly, um, you know, how to, you know, some of the things that I just wanna talk about when it comes to resilience to, um, you know, at this time during, during COVID. Okay, so, so the impact of COVID-19 right now that's happening with us, so um, I'm gonna just put my glasses on because it helps me a little bit. We want to we want to ex uh, explore the, the the factors and understand the impact of COVID-19 pandemic right now in the lives of anyone. I don't think there's anybody here that can say that COVID-19 has not impacted them one way or the other. I'm sure, right? Um, and uh, we want to talk about resilience because we don't just want to talk about how it impacts us, but the resilience and staying emotionally and mentally healthy during this stressful time. So we wanna be able to help you and, and give you tools. That's what we say, we give you tools in order to help you to be resilient. There is no one here, like I said, that has not been imp impacted by COVID-19 uh, or reshape, or COVID-19 has not reshaped their life one way or the other, positive or negative, right? Uh, and the media, of course, has, we keep hearing report every single day about how COVID-19, the pandemic has impacted the whole world. Um, supporting family, because I believe that this is our strength right here. Um, I know we, there's a lot of people here that are youth um, and um, we rely on our family. Family is important. Um, so we need to think about our family at this time, how our family could be part of this healing process. First of all, let's talk about the grieving. You know, we are all grieving. We're all going through something right now, right? We need to experience our own grief while um, respecting the, the and supporting each other during the grieving process because we all grieve at different times. You know, some people, you know, they go through certain stages of grief and some people, they go through faster or slower. It doesn't matter how we're going through the grief. We just have to remember that it's okay. It's normal for us to go through grief, right? We just need some tools and support during this time. So um, we want to talk about a little bit about what does grief look like? Because some people don't know what grief really look like. They're just full of a lot of emotion and they don't know what it looks like exactly. That could be in a form of sadness, anger, confusion, or you know, you're blaming someone, you know, just blaming, you don't know why you're blaming people, <laughs> you know, just blaming people, relief. So those are the things that you know, it could look like, right? When it comes to, uh, when it comes to, um, you know, grieving. So we should not hide our emotion. We should be able to express our emotion during this time, right? Because we're, you know, we're so busy. Now we're a little bit not, not as busy, right? We need to identify and accept those emotions and natural parts of grieving, right? So we need to be able to express it 
when we are acting or learning to, like we need to sit down and learn and think and say, you know what? Let me think about what's going on. Let me, let me, do, let me put words to how I feel. Because some people don't know how to put words to the way they're feeling at that particular time. Sister Biela, your slide is not moving. My slide is not moving? Yeah. It's, oh. We're just seeing mental health and resilience during COVID-19. Okay, um, I, I am moving it, but I don't know why it's not moving. Oh, actually, uh, so that was intentional. That's what happened to me. Okay, let me see. Does that move? No. No? No. Is it moving again? No. How, how is that? Is that moving? No, you yeah, stop sharing. Okay, I stop sharing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you put bring me back then? Maybe. Well, you you want to share again? Yeah. So how would I come back? Let me see. Oh, you just do what you did before. Okay. Now? Yeah. I'm, I'm stuck in here in the presentation. Right. So under under the screen where you see everybody's faces, under you see three different icons like a mic. Then I don't, someone... I don't see anybody right now. I don't see oh. icons. It's, it's in full screen. So what are you seeing on your screen? My pre presentation. Oh, so you are probably on a different window. So look for where the Google Meet window is. Okay, you know what? I how about here. Do you see me? We can see you clearly. Okay, do you see the presentation? No. Okay. You know, why don't you just go ahead the way you you've been talking about it? You can just proceed. Okay. I yeah, just proceed without sharing. Okay. So that's fine. Yeah. You, you're doing a good job. I, yeah. I don't know what happened. Uh, it's it, I'm moving it along, but it, it's not really moving along with me. I don't know why. Yeah, it could um, be your bandwidth. Maybe it's not strong enough. Oh, that could be it too. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, you're sharing so now. Do you, do you, do, yeah, I, I'm going to leave it like this. I'm not going to leave it full screen. Okay. Okay? Okay. Is that fine? Okay. Yeah, no that's problem. fine. So we talked about the impact of it. Uh, of COVID-19, right? So I'm just going to move it along to the next one. Uh, we talked about grieving. So we, we, this is the fourth slide. So now we're going to talk about struggling. As family, you know, we're going through the struggling right now. Uh, we're struggling for control, right? right? Um, you know, the, the control that we normally have, you know, like um, everyday routine control, we don't have that anymore, right? We're, we're told by the government to stay home. <laughs> and that's very difficult for a lot of people to be able to say, uh, how can I stay home when I have so many things to do and um, you know, people to feed, bills to pay, uh, business to, to support. So we, if we feel like we lost control, so we need to plan and plan and have a goal, even though we feel like we have lost control at this time, you know? So we need to still plan, we still, to make some plans and to go forward. It's all about going forward and not giving up, right? And we need to remember that things uh, doesn't always go our way. You have to remember life, life is up and down and it, things might not go our way all the time, right? But when it doesn't go our way, it doesn't mean that we can't adjust. We can adjust our way according to the situation. Um, I find that a lot of people that are flexible in, in nature, they're the more very resilient people because they're flexible and they can move according to where they need to move for that particular day or week. But people that are not flexible, I find that this, they find it very difficult to make to make changes, and that could be very challenging for them. And uh, so we want to talk about um, also we need to be you know we need the predictability, right? I know like team. So you, you notice that um, in the news, the, some families are showing some of the things that they're doing as a family and how they're keeping up with the routine. The time they're waking up is the same. The kids are doing their homework, you know, at a particular time. They'll have dinner with their family at the same time. 
So keeping up with the routine is very important because you want that rhythm because rhythm calms us. <laughs> rhythm makes us calm and relax and knowing that, okay, I don't have to figure out what I'm gonna do tomorrow, right? So it's important for us to keep up that routine ongoing. That would really, really help us. And that could be routine in business and your career, in the family, whichever one, you need to just be able to work on that, right? So let's talk about um, the importance of excellence. You know, there's some people that are very high achievers and they are they just believe in, you know, high achievement. And, and if they don't reach this certain level of excellence, they feel that um, it's not doable, they can't do it. Um, we have to remember that this is a very difficult time. The pandemic is changing the world, has changed the world, and it, it's changed the world forever. So you have to remember that you, you need to be, like we're talking about being flexible again, right? Do not expect excellent at this time. Because if we do expect excellence at this time, we may be, um, um, you know, really um, causing ourselves to, you know, to, you know, to fail. And we don't want to do that, right? We cannot control everything at this time. So, but it's important for us, like, to look, we want to be able to look back as a family. Look back as a family and say, you know what? During this COVID time, when the, we were forced to be at home, when we, we didn't have control, but we have some control to a certain extent. What did I achieve? What happened? What did I do as a, you know, as a family? What did we achieve as a family? What did I achieve as an individual? You know, so you can ask yourself, how have I personally changed, right? Or who, who am I? Maybe we don't even know who we are because we're so busy. We're so busy, 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 busy. You know, I always say to people that being in this country is like a rat race. And, and that is like, we keep going around and around and around and around and we, we don't stop because there's so much that we have to do. But COVID has allowed us to sit down and think and reflect on what's going on in our lives. So we have to, you know, think back, you know, we want to sit back and say, you know, what did I achieve as a family? What did we do together? How, were we closer together? Did we learn more about each other? What lesson do we have to learn? You know, have we connected more as a family or actually, have we had more disconnection? Because that could happen too. The more time you spend with someone and you get to know them, they might, you might realize, you know what, maybe you know, we're less connected because now I know more about this person that I, that I didn't really wanna know. But this is a good thing because then now, now you can work together as a family on connecting and understanding each other even better. So telling people you appreciate them, building community connection, very important at this time. And so the next slide is really about, we want you to, to give yourself permission to slow down. Slow down, you know, um, during this time, it's okay. You know, we don't have to be going 100 miles an hour or whatever, you just relax, you know. Um, I know some people right now, they have the fear of uh, disapproval, they feel that they have to do so much with, somebody calls them up, okay, I'll do it. Somebody does this, I have to do it. Because they feel this thing of rejection that if they don't do all these things and, and if they're as busy, as busy, as busy, that what happens is that the people, the, the, you know, people will not approve of them. We have to remember that self-care is very important at this time. We have to be able to remember those things. So when people are seeking per permission from others, what normally happens is that they develop things like anxiety, you know, depression, low self-esteem, you know, the feeling the need to gain permission. And these things, this is what causes that, you know. So, um, so it's important to be able to give ourselves permission, relax. Um, you know, if we have fear, ask ourselves, why are we fearful? What is making us fearful? Ask us ourselves questions. You know, if we feel anxiety, name it. Say, I think I feel a little bit of anxiety. I don't know why, but then you think about it, reflect. Why are you feeling anxiety about this thing? You know, why am I feeling low esteem about this thing? What, what's really happening to me? Why do I feel this way? Ask yourself these questions all the time, because it's okay, you know, to be able to feel those and to be able to name those things. And so while we're doing this is that, so we want to be able to, like for me, 
Um, so we, you know, some people say they have more time than ever. <laughs> some people are like, I have so much time, I don't know what to do with it. And then some people say, you know what, I'm a little bit busy. And there's very few people telling me actually they weren't really busy. Um, but for me personally, I am more busy. I've never been so, so much busy in my whole life ever since the pandemic started as a healthcare worker, as a nurse. We have been so busy. There's so many need. Um, our, our, our clients level is just more need, more people waiting on the waiting list. This is such a great need for help and support. And even have my own business, doing a staffing agency, there's a huge need for nurses and PSW to work. So I, my business has been so busy that I, I've never been so busy in my life. So I, I say to myself, I better slow down a little bit because you have to be careful that you're not over um, stressing myself. So that's something that I have to also remember, right? Um, and then opportunity to slow down. So whenever I get the opportunity to slow down, I just slow down. I put my feet up and I watch a nice movie, I relax. I have my me time, you know, my time for myself, right? So give yourself permission to relax. Give yourself permission to, to take some time off for yourself and not stress yourself and not thinking about, you know, I, you know there's bills to be paid, things I need to do. I need a job. I need a job. And every day, you know, I, when I get people calling for jobs, for my agency, that's what I hear. I need a job right now. They're desperate for a job. Anything that they can do. So, but you know, we need to relax. We need to take some your, some time, and you know, think about what we are, what we what we're going through, who we are, and what's the next step for us. What is the next step for you? You know, maybe maybe the way you were going before COVID, it wasn't the right direction. Maybe you want to go in a different direction now. So that could be something that you want to look into. So. Um, so you wanted to talk about the, you know the two that we still want to talk about two ways of giving yourself permission. So, so I know some people might say I don't know how to give myself permission <laughs> to slow down. So one of the ways is to limit your availability, right? So when people are calling you to do this, to do that, pick and choose what is really more passionate to you, right? So when you do that, at least you're not overwhelming yourself, right? And saying yes to everyone. Okay, that's one way. And be mentally still. Make sure your mental health, your thinking is, is, is balanced, you know, that you're taking some time to relax, you know, giving your, your mind some time to, to relax and, um, you know, just enjoy life, enjoy things. So self, I, I call this self-care. This is important that we have self-care. And we talk about it at work all the time, you know, for all the nurses and healthcare workers to have. Self-care is important. Like, for me, it's just maybe taking like 20 minutes, 30 minutes just to be on the treadmill, just to, you know, just to, and listen to some music. So relaxing. I love it. You know, it really helps me to just think about what's going on and just relax myself. Okay. Next slide is, so we're going to talk about four benefits of practicing gratitude because I, we feel that practicing gratitude helps people to see what they have and where they're at. You know, when you know when you, what you have, then you can appreciate your, you know, things more. So practicing uh, gratitude is so, so important that, you know, because when you, when, when you don't, when you're under stress, you know, if you, don't, if you don't practice, you know, gratitude, you put yourself a lot of, on a lot of physical stress and physical stress causes pain, physical pain, tension, right? Your heart rate is even high, faster. Right, so and we don't want that. We don't we want to get rid of that that stress. Right. So the benefit of gratitude is it reduces that stress, it reduces the pain, it reduces the tension, and reduces your your heart rate. Another thing is um, deepening and really feeling genuine appreciation. Right. Look at your surrounding. Look at around you. Look where you are. Look at the country you are in. You know. Look at what the things that God has blessed you with and the things that you have and, and you know, be grateful. Thank, thank, you know, thank God for those things. Because some people, some other people around the world don't have such opportunity that we have in Canada. So we have to remember to just look around us and just really be, really be grateful to, for those things. And that we're fortunate um, for, for being where we are and uh, being surrounded by people in the community that loves and cares about us. Um, so we want to take a moment 
and think about something. So just take take uh, uh, 30 seconds right now and just think about what you're grateful for. You know, just 30 seconds, just quick. What are you grateful for right now? Look around you and just think about that. Think about what you're grateful for. So, so I'm just going to keep going because of time, but I want you to keep thinking about that, right? Um, so the next slide is, so how do we manage this anxiety, fear during COVID time? How do we manage this? Things? How do we cope with our feelings during COVID? How do we cope with the anxiety and fear during COVID? Well, you know what? There's a couple of things that we can do. In, in, when I work as a mental health nurse, when we are working with our clients, we, look, we call something uh, coping strategies, that we, we sit down and we talk with the clients about coping strategy. What are the things that they can do when they're feeling anxious, when they're feeling depressed, when they're feeling fear? What are the things that they can do that will reduce that or take their mind off it? And we write it down and then we type it up and then we give it to them so that they'll always have it in their hands. So when they're feeling this, this is what they do. Some people say taking a walk makes me feel good. I get fresh air, I get the sun. That could be something that someone might want to do. And, and it's wonderful because when you get that sun on you, the vitamin D, it's wonderful feeling. And that fresh air, you feel alive, feel great, right? And you come back, you're more productive. Some people say taking a shower. I just love to take a shower. It just calms me down, relaxes me. Whatever works for you, you know, do that. So I want to talk about some of the things that you could use in case, you know, you're thinking of what can I use? What can I do to reduce and manage my anxiety and fear at this time? Being creative, creative creativity is one of those things that you can use. And it's just something that uh, has a beginning and an end, right? Having a project, something that's light, simple, you know, something that you, you never had time to do, and now maybe you can do it. So maybe it's cooking or baking or pu doing a puzzle or bu building something. That's one thing that you can actually think about. Another one is humor. You know, humor is a, is a wonderful thing. Being able to laugh is a wonderful thing. And I remember at one time they actually said uh, one of the happiest people, a country in the world, is they, they named Nigeria as one of them at one point. And I say, you know what, they're probably right. Yes, it is. Because Nigerian people are very happy people. <laughs> and um, it's, um, we have resilience in, in, in Nigeria. So humor is a great way to connect with people. For me, what I do, I have a chat group, WhatsApp chat group with my sibling. What we do is that we, we send you know, funny things, humor, uh, jokes, or inform information thing. When COVID hit, we had this chat group before COVID. And then after COVID, it was even more, more important for us to connect more than ever. And we use this to connect, to talk. And it's, it's been so wonderful to be able to connect with my siblings. Maybe you need to connect with some people, like they're far away. Have a group, to, you know, get a WhatsApp group or something going, whereby you can just share your information and you can connect with each other you know, tell jokes, do, you know, read funny books or whatever, whatever works for you, maybe this might be something for you. Another thing is being, you know, curiosity. And that's important too. It's important for us to be a little, um, curiosity is very important. Do not let your thoughts uh, take control or power or over you, you know. Uh, the power of stress, people don't know the power of stress. Uh, stress is really a big beginning of mental health. People don't know this. And when I was in school, I didn't know this myself. I didn't even know the power of stress until I went to school and I realized this is important that, you know, you keep your stressful life, your, you know, stress really to the minimum as much as possible because that can cause a lot of damage to you. So you want to be, you know, curious. You want to, you know, explore things. Um, but don't, don't always believe uh, everything that you're thinking about. Because sometimes when we're sitting down, we overthink something. So you have to say to yourself, is this thing real? Is what I'm saying, is it real? Is it reality? Is it true? And that's one of the things we teach our, our clients as well. Is it true? If it's not true, then to what extent is not true? 
So, and, and then, you know, be able to focus on the reality of things. Um, and then, um, so we talked about, I just mentioned right now about that, uh, you know, if it's true or not, and the humor part of it. And the next one is just really, don't believe everything you think, uh, because sometimes when we're, when we're thinking and we're feeling anxiety and stress, it might not be completely true. And another one is the curiosity I said about anxiety and fear and worrying that we have to make sure that we are, you know, we, we feel it. When we feel it, let's name it. Let's say, you know, I'm, I'm worried. Okay, say it. I'm worried. Why am I worried? Talk about it. Share it. Don't be afraid, you know, when you, you know, to be able to name those things. And what do I need? Um, to, what can I do about the situation? And then, you know, instead of worrying about it, so what can we do about that situation at that point? You know, so that we know we're getting somewhere or we're trying to solve this problem. Okay. Um, and then the, this is the second last slide here. And it's just really about breathing. You know, I, I'm sure a lot of you, uh, many people have heard about the power of breathing, breathing through your nose slowly and breathing out through your mouth. Um, that it, it, it lowers your heart rate, um, it relaxes you, it calms you. So even if you're doing that every day or whenever you feel that anxiety or fear or, you know, you're feeling, you know, very bad that day, you don't feel well, just doing some breathing exercise definitely will help. Um, and there's a lot of websites that actually can help you with that and give you some insights on that. And this is... This is the end of my presentation. I, I hope you learned something, um, and I hope you to gain something from it. And um, you know, as I said, um, you know, resilience during this time is very important. That we can't give up. We are not meant to give up. We are to move forward. We're to you know, you know, do things, reinvent ourselves, whatever it takes to move forward, and to support each other as a family and in the community. Please let us. Remember that. And if you need help, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. If you need uh, to reach out to a doctor, to reach out to a nurse, to reach out to a family member, someone that you trust, um, to talk about how you're feeling. And, and if you need more healthcare support, please don't be afraid to reach out and get the support. And don't be ashamed, because I know that there's a taboo when it comes to mental health amongst uh, uh, black people and different countries. Um, so don't be afraid when you're going through a difficult time because the later you get help, uh, the, the longer this, this situation is there. So thank you everybody for having me. I appreciate this time. And I hope someone, even if it's one person that would gain something today regarding mental health and resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Abiola. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'll ask if anybody has a question, um, but I haven't seen any uh, question in the chat box. In the interest of time, I'll just ask one question. Just if you have just one advice for our youth on how to handle emotional stressful situation in school, what would you say? Just one advice. For school, um, one advice I would definitely say to the youth is that for the youth to reach out to someone that you really trust, someone that you you know that you know will give you the true advice, um, advice, because of what we having we having more and more youth that are going through mental health in school, um, elementary school, middle school, and high school, and the the only reason why their mental health is becoming, it becomes worse is because they didn't talk about it. They didn't share it with someone. Um, they kept it to themselves because they're, they're afraid and they're ashamed about how they're feeling and what, what their mind is telling them, is saying. Don't be afraid. I mean, we're all human and we all, it's a journey in life. And sometimes in doing our journey, we need help. It's okay to get help. Get the help that you need. Talk to someone that you trust. If it's a teacher, talk to a teacher. If it's you know a family member, your parents, talk to your parents. You know, talk to someone, and then let's then decide if you need more help. If you need a healthcare support, you know, if you need to talk to your doctor about it. And I, I know a lot of people they're very they're very comfortable with their doctor, family doctor, right? So you know, reach out. 
even if you want to talk to your doctor about it, you don't want anybody else to know, reach out to your doctor, make an appointment. Because I know they make an appointment on the phone, you know, uh, online. Do it. And then get the help that you need. Because we realize that a lot of um, clients that we have, whether it's bipolar, whether it's schizophrenia, whether it's, you know, depression or whatever they're going through, it's been years they've been going through it. And now it has become worse. And now it's become uncontrollable because they did not seek the help that they needed at the beginning because they're ashamed of it. You know, they're, they're hiding it. They don't want no one to know. Don't be ashamed of it, right? We all need help at one time or the other. The sooner we can get help, and I have to really stress that, the sooner we can get help, the better we, you know, we're going to be. And, you know, whatever it is, maybe medication, we need some medication that will help us. Maybe we need to do some exercise or to do, to get some activity going to get, you know, or to take some courses on our thoughts, the way we think. Cognitive um, therapy, you know, it is, there's actually courses on that. And I've taken the course, it's wonderful. It teaches you how to handle your thoughts. So there's help out there. There's resources out, resources out there. Reach out and get the help that you need. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here. Um, let's make this one quickly and uh, we'll move on. Is there a helpline for adults, like the kids helpline? Yes, there is. There's a helpline. Uh, I can pass that on to uh, the council um, later on to share it with everybody. Um, there's even public health. Uh, if, you, if you Google public health, they have so many different um, resources regarding mental health uh, to reach out for youth for adults, um, even if you have a family member or someone that you know, a friend or a family member, that you think that they need help, you know, you know, help, help them, advocate for them. It's important for us, for us to advocate for each other. If we don't advocate for each other, who, who's gonna advocate for us then, right? So there is, and I will share it later on. Again, thank you very much, Ms. Abiola, for your time and the, the answers you've provided. We are so grateful for all this information. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to introduce Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a fresh graduate with a double major in political science and law and justice. He's currently studying to get into law school. He's an ardent volunteer with CMP, ACCH, and several other non-for-profit organizations. He enjoys designing. In fact, he is the brains behind the CMP flyers that you see. Emmanuel will be announcing the gifts for the three winners of the essay competition. And over to you, Emmanuel. Thank you for the introduction. It is my pleasure to present the various prizes we have for our winners. You have taken the time to work and CMP is appreciating you for speaking and taking the time to write your essay. To our first winner, Amar Igrino. He is, he is born in Nigeria and is 16 at the moment. He wants to become a medical doctor in the future and in his free time, he draws and writes stories. We present to you your plaque courtesy of Council of Nigeria Professionals, as well as the certificate that will be mailed to you, accompanied with a check of $500. And because you shared the interest into entering the medical field with us, we are matching you with a mentor, a medical practitioner, Dr. Ikena Ipanchi. Dr. Ikena. Um, he was born in Delta State, Nigeria. He had his education in Delta State studying medicine in the University of Benin. After completing his one year internship and youth service, he worked as a general practitioner in Lagos for close to seven years before migrating to Canada with his family. In Canada, he had to write a medical license examination before he was given his license to practice as a family physician in Saskatchewan, where he lives with his family. He will be mentoring you for 12 months starting April 2021. Please join me in celebrating and congratulating Amar Igrino. Thank you so much. No problem. Oh. So the plaque, the certificates, and the check will be mailed to you 
at the appropriate time. To our second place winner, Kayla Iase. Ms. Kayla was born and raised in Nigeria and lived in the US for a few years before moving to Canada. She's 15 years old and in grade 10. She's very familiar with social media and tries her best to remove her biases when expressing her views and takes. She's a proud Nigerian Canadian and loves to participate in her culture. Her mother is the biggest inspiration as she continues to look up to her to this day. We present to you your plaque, courtesy of Council of Nigerian Professionals, as well as the certificate that will be mailed to you accompanied with your $300 check. And since you also shared interest in becoming a medical professor, professional, we will be matching with a mentor as well, Dr. Tunde Ajaye who was born in Nigeria and studied at the College of Medicine at University of Lagos. He is happily married with children to a medical doctor as well, qualified in practicing as a family physician in Nova Scotia. He will be also mentoring for 12 months starting April 2021. Please join me in celebrating and congratulating Kayla Iase. Thank you. Thank you. Now, for our third place winner, Nicola Odu. She is an Nigerian Canadian who studies at Bishop P.F. Ryden Catholic Secondary School. There are quite a few things that she wishes to share with us. For one, she loves getting, she loves digging deeper into topics that focus on racism and prejudice in Canada and has profound conversations with friends and class, friends, classmates, and family on how to fix these issues that affect the Black community. She enjoys food from all different types of cultures, reading crime novels and listening to political podcasts. She takes pleasure in giving back to the community and hopes to continue her journey of self-discovery in the medical field. I believe we're seeing a pattern here. We present to you your plaque, courtesy of Council of Nigerian Professionals, a certificate from a member of parliament, as well as your check of $200 that will all be mailed to you. And as the others, as you shared interest in entering the medical field, you are being matched with a medical practitioner, Dr. Jaye Oba, who is a family physician in Saskatchewan. She has wealthy, she has a wealth of experience in primary health care, both in community and hospital, hospital level, including rural and urban settings. She's a member of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. She has an MA in data analysis and an MBA with a focus in digital transformation. Like the others, she will be mentoring for 12 months starting April, 2021. Please join me in celebrating and congratulating Nicola. Thank you so much, everyone. Like, like was stated before, your certificates, your plaque and your check will be mailed to you when everything is brought together. This is an annual event for us at CMP. So we urge you to encourage your youth to partake in our next Black History Month essay competition. As you never know, they could get a mentor who could be with them for 12 months straight. And with that being said, I'd like to pass it on to Miss Deborah Ujo. Thank you, Deborah. Another big round of applause for our our this and congratulations, congratulations, everyone. Kayla, uh, your emotional um, speech about your hair almost brought me to tears. I could see our presidents and I could see patients as well. Uh, very emotional when you share that story. I will try to connect with you also personally. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. Ama, I was very impressed with um, you are only 15 years old or 16 years old, and I'm trying to understand if you were only 16 years old and you had that many years of experience. So that was very inspirational. And uh, Nicola Oju, uh, you have such a wonderful story about your mom and how she's motivating you to do all those things. Honestly, we are listening, and you using your voice, like um, Laura said, it's, it's wonderful because it's helping other generations. Um, behind you to also understand 
the pressure, what they are facing. And we are sharing these stories to also understand that you're not in it alone. As adults, everybody is facing it. So thank you so much for using your voice. We want to thank everybody, Wakanda, <laughs> Manuel. We want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Uh, Mrs. Abiola Akiremi, thank you for gracing us with your time today. We really want to thank you. I want to thank um, Laura May Lindo for um, blessing us with uh, not only just a speech and igniting the fire in us, but also our, our voice, our spirituality. And she's teaching us not to be afraid of our spiritual being because it, it completes us. Uh, thank you so much, Laura May, for coming to talk to us about this. In Kechi Wafo, thank you so much uh, for showing up tonight. She 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 she's a fire. She she, <laughs> she just I'm like, where is this woman I guess her energy from? I have to connect with her because I think I'm an introvert, but like I, I I don't talk like she she brought all the fire and she helped us understand who we are and how to integrate those and try to balance it. We really want to thank you. We've learned so much. I I I I want to concur with uh, Mr. Michael Mike that said that this is one of a kind. You know, um, this is one of a kind. We for sure be putting all of this on our YouTube channel on our social media. Um, please follow us. We'll put all the links on the on the chats as well. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. We want to thank Baba for always um, entertaining us with your music. Every time we call upon you, you are always here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for our president, Mrs. Adejisola Atiba, that um, continue to inspire us, continue to motivate us, continue to stand by us, and to make sure that everything today we did was a success. We really want to thank you for your um, leadership. We really appreciate you at CMP. Uh, all our directors, patients, uh, Mike, thank you so much for giving us your time. They spent countless time and hours just making sure everything was um was well done thank you to our sponsors that without you guys you know your financial assistance rooting for us we might not be here what's where we are today so thank you so much for putting your mouth putting your money where your mouth is so we really want to thank you thank you to all our youth for participating you know we, we wanted to make sure that it was it was delightful for us to have you, and we we we, we are sure it's delightful for you too. You know, those mentorships will for sure add a lot of value, and I'm very excited. I'm rooting for each and every one of you, seeing you in greater height, and you are truly our future. And at CMP, this is one of our core values. Thank you so much. Um, I think now Baba is going to continue with music, music, music. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Amazing.
Thank you.